Roman Chime, I would like to welcome all on the day three of our first IDM for 2022. And the day three will start with a panel that is called Migration Inclusion in COVID Recovery in, and Social Protection, a renewed social contract. The moderator is of this distinguished panel is Mr. Mirius Olivier, extraordinary professor, faculty of law, University of Northwest South Africa, Institute of Social Law and Policy. Mr. Marius Olivier, please, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Dijan Kesarovic. Um, ladies and gentlemen, friends, colleagues, it's uh, my esteemed pleasure to welcome you to this session, uh, the title of which has already been announced. Uh, we have uh, three distinct um, panelists whom I will introduce within a moment. Uh, for the moment, um, for now, I could uh, tell you they are the Honorable Sarah Lou Ariola from the Philippines, the forward uh, Masukut Watsu from Bristol, and the Charles Senesi uh, from um, the Afri Afro-European Medical um, and Research Network. And uh, these colleagues are going to address us soon on, on very important issues. Um, Perhaps by way of, of an introduction, the background for what we are talking about today, of course, um, uh, informed largely by the COVID-19 period, the pandemic. And I thought maybe at the beginning just to make a few short remarks on the uh, social protection responses in particular that we have seen in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic and the lessons that we can learn um, um, as far as that is concerned, uh, but for purposes of this new social contract and the common agenda being highlighted in the Secretary General's um, you know, response um, last year. Of course, it leads us uh, from the common agenda through to the, uh, the SGDs, the Sustainable Development Goals, and in particular also the Global Compact on Migration, um, our guide there, and, as far as social protection is concerned, of course, would be Objective 22. Um, and perhaps what we should say as an overall remark is that the crisis, the COVID-19 crisis has demonstrated that effective social protection systems are crucial to safeguarding poor and vulnerable people when crisis hits. Uh, yet the emerging pattern of COVID-19 responses um, with lockdowns and other types of restrictions shows that countries with weak state-run social assistance lag far behind in shielding livelihoods and the economy from lasting damage. So we have seen a number of interesting and very important state-based social protection responses targeting migrants um, in, in uh, this period. Uh, we're still in the pandemic and we want to look at some of these responses and also how this has been uh, translated in legal terms. Um, very briefly, some governments and international institutions have responded by providing social protection measures that are aimed at assisting migrants experiencing the socioeconomic impacts of COVID-19. Latin America, for example, and the Caribbean, um, there we have found a few trains of social protection responses that include migrants that have been identified through a joint UNICEF, IPC, IG, and WFP regional study. The response to the pandemic in some countries has reflected, on the other hand, a pre-covered exclusion pattern negatively affecting regular migrants who are already excluded um, from the national social protection response. Yet, on the other hand, Brazil presents an interesting case of a country with a favorable legal framework that allows social assistance programs to include asylum seekers and refugees. There are also a few interesting examples provided by the IAM of what countries of origin have done in relation to their own migrant workers abroad. The Philippines, for example, extended a unilateral one-time grant of 200 US dollars to citizens uh, overseas. There are also several cases of countries that have instituted return arrangements for its citizens, uh, for example, Neta Nepal. Thailand and Indonesia also extended monetary and other support to returnees. Uh, in Lesotho, for example, we have seen the Lesotho government reaching out to its own citizens based in South Africa, at least with a one-time in-kind um, support given to them. 
and in the global north, documented migrant workers in formal employment are likely um, to have access to social insurance, which has benefited those migrants during the COVID-19 crisis. Legally speaking, several countries have adjusted their legal frameworks to enable migrants to access social protection in the COVID-19 context. As mentioned, Brazil has a favorable legal framework that allows asylum seekers and refugees to access social assistance programs. And uh, in, in the South African context, for example, uh, the South African government has, has extended a special social relief and distress grant uh, to, in, to capture um, also refugees, asylum seekers, and, and certain categories of regularized um, uh, migrants with um, temporary, if I could use that word, uh, permanent residence being granted to them. That grant has recently been extended for another year. So our conclusions and uh, recommendations um, can be summarized as follows, that it's necessary to combine uh, in the wake then also of the common agenda, protection measures with enhanced access to healthcare, universal healthcare, as well as social work and child protection services. Secondly, to allow migrants to participate in labor market activity as it provides a lifeline for individuals and households in the wake of border closures. Thirdly, to acknowledge remittance service providers as essential services since they are important for migrant workers to keep assisting their families in their country of origin and ensure um, that appropriate measures are in place to facilitate remittance transfers. Fourthly, to facilitate inclusion in social protection schemes in countries of origin for citizens who have been working abroad. Uh, and the second last instance, to design firewalls between social protection and immigration services so that the requirements to report undocumented migrants who are in registers of social protection uh, to the immigration department are eliminated. It is important and necessary to align immigration law and policy with social protection provision. And finally, beware of unintended consequences flowing from the formal inclusion of migrant workers in social protection, yet they may be excluded in reality, implying that they may effectively be co contributing to the social protection system to which they have no access, and yet it's all for the benefit of nationals. We see some of these examples in countries uh, currently. So let me then introduce um, our speakers, our esteemed panel, and uh, I'll then one by one as I as I'm going to speak. Um, our first speaker is the Honourable Sarah Low Arihola, and uh, she is the Under Secretary for Migrant Workers Affairs Department of Foreign Affairs in the Philippines, and she will share with us the Philippine government's accomplished accomplishments under the Global Compact for Migration's Objective 5 on enhanced availability and flexibility of pathways for regular migration, but also uh, Objective 6 to facilitate fair and ethical recruitment and safeguard conditions that ensure decent work. Um, and in particular, she will highlight the Kafala reform campaign that the Philippines is advocating in the Middle East. Uh, Ms. Sarola, Honorable Areola has an esteemed career and uh, with um, accolades, the recognition of the services rendered uh, through the awarding of a Grand Cross in 2019 in the Philippines. Um, so we're looking forward to, to listen to uh, the Honorable uh, Sarah Areola from the Philippines. Thank you. Excellencies and partners in migration, good evening from Manila. We are once again honored to be part of the first session of this year's International Dialogue on Migration. The IOM has been a staunch partner of the Philippines in its efforts to advance and strengthen the country's migration governance. As a GCM champion country, we cannot overemphasize our support for the implementation of the Global Compact for Migration. The Philippines has consistently been active in its development, negotiations, and adoption. The pandemic did not stop the Philippines to breathe life into the GCM. In fact, the pandemic strengthened our resolve to push for labor mobility in the Middle East, combat trafficking in persons, and incorporate the GCM objectives in our domestic legislation. 
Today, I'm glad to share a groundbreaking achievement for the GCM implementation in the Philippines, the enactment of the Department of Migrant Workers Act, which took effect on February 3 this year. This is the first law in the world that codifies the progressive realization of the 23 objectives of the GCM. Our existing key offices with migration-related functions are now consolidated into a single streamlined entity serving our migrant workers. The law likewise defines ethical recruitment that enhances the protection of Filipino migrant workers. The law will ensure that labor migration is safe, orderly, and regular. Labor mobility and human rights are two key, two key principles that the Philippines banner in its GCM journey. Our wavering efforts are rooted in the campaign to reform Kafala, a traditional sponsorship system in the Middle East wherein workers are bound to their employers or sponsors during the duration of their contract and are not allowed to transfer to another employer, go home, and leave their employers without their sponsor's consent in spite of poor and abusive working conditions. The unintended consequence of kafala can result to slavery and slave-like conditions. Advancing reforms to kafala has since brought remarkable developments and enabled us to collaborate with countries of destinations, such as Bahrain, Qatar, UAE, and Saudi Arabia. With the GCM as our guiding framework, this moment in history has now become a movement the new civil rights movement for migrants that will only get stronger as long as injustice remains. While there are many challenges along the way, political will from both countries of origin and destination is the key in reforming the system. Among our milestones of kafala reform is when Bahrain introduced its flexi visa system in 2017, allowing its irregular migrant workers to be freelance workers and not have their visas tied to a specific employer. The Philippines, beginning 2018, has invested at least 1.5 million U.S. dollars to purchase flexi visas for 1,075 Filipino migrant workers. We are the only country that spent government funds to regularize its migrant workers. This is consistent with objectives five and six of the GCM. Another feat is our continued commitment to pursue trafficking cases of our nationals. One particular case involves two overseas Filipino workers who were survivors of trafficking and sexual exploitation committed by fellow Filipinos and foreign nationals in Bahrain. Both Filipino survivors gave their statements in the Philippines and the suspects were later apprehended, prosecuted, and convicted in Bahrain in 2020. This highlights international cooperation between the Philippines and Bahrain in seeking justice across borders. It is vital that a country of origin supports and encourages a country of destination that institutes reforms in order to make that reform succeed. Meanwhile, in Syria, there were reports of trafficked Filipino women who were undocumented workers. They all ran away from their employers and were eventually sheltered at the Philippine embassy. In 2021, we brought home 110 trafficked Filipinos and assisted them in filing criminal complaints against the traffickers both in the Philippines and in Syria. In February 2022, we had an unprecedented win for the first human trafficking case filed before the Damascus court, making it a landmark judicial victory awarded by a Syrian court in favor of Filipinos. The Philippine government spent almost 120,000 US dollars to provide the necessary assistance to our distressed overseas Filipinos. At the height of the pandemic, we anchored our COVID-19 response in the five R's, relief, repatriation, recovery, return, and reintegration. We facilitated the repatriation of almost 2 million overseas Filipinos. We also mounted over 110 chartered flights to bring our stranded nationals home, no matter the cost. To anticipate many Filipinos who wish to go back to the workforce, the government put up policies for their safe return to work overseas. Among these is establishment of a green lane policy for the crew change of seafarers at ports. The Philippines has the largest number of seafarers serving the world's merchant and cruise fleets. You recognize that they are essential workers and their role towards global economic recovery should remain unhampered. Together with other member states, the government further continues its efficient rollout of the vaccination program and issuance of the WHO Agreed International Certificate of Vaccination and Prophylaxis. 
We issue our citizens a vaccination certificate called VaxCert PH, which is compliant with international health standards, especially on the recommendations of the WHO Smart Vaccination Certification Working Group issued in September 2021. This is instrumental for us in jump-starting mobility, which has been affected by the pandemic the most. Colleagues, migrant protection has been at the core of our services. This would not have been possible without vigorous partnerships with countries of destination and migration stakeholders. Present challenges are now interconnected and cut across borders and nations. This is the time for global solidarity, to maintain multilateral efforts and collective action to not only fight against COVID-19, but to ensure that migrants are afforded protection by all states, whether they are in countries of origin, transit, or destination. The protection needed also goes beyond labor protection. Protection against racism and xenophobia has never been more paramount than now. Ironically, Filipinos have been at the receiving end of Asian hate, but it is our health workers who are serving the front lines of the national health systems of countries of destination. We believe that rebuilding this kind of social contract among ourselves can deliver aspirations of a safe, orderly, and regular migration capable within our reach. As we move towards the IMRF, we hope to have more meaningful and fruitful discussions to strengthen the implementation of the GCM. I would like to take this opportunity to thank fellow member states, the IOM, the UN Migration Network, and the partners in civil society for the relentless cooperation in advancing the GCM and protection of our migrants in these trying times. This only by working as one can we recover as one and eventually heal as one. Thank you very much. Back to you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you. We thank the Honorable Sarah Louis Ariola for her uh, very informative uh, contribution, um, which uh, we will be discussing when we open the floor for, for comments and uh, participation. Our second speaker is Mr. Forward uh, Masuku Watsu. Um, he is an, an inclusion advisor of the mayor of Bristol. Um, he will share the city's perspective on supporting migrant inclusion and social protection partnership with the government and other relevant partners on this. We'll also present what are the possible opportunities and innovative solutions that can be introduced to ensure full migrant inclusion and social cohesion and empower both migrants and communities in the COVID-19 response and recovery from a local perspective. In addition, he uh, would expand, expand on the contribution of cities as change makers on global issues more specifically, role for cities within the uh, GC. As I've said, he works as inclusion advisor, was a former journalist from Zimbabwe. He also worked as communication manager for the Refugees Asylum Seekers and Media Project run by the Media Wise Trust, a journalism ethics charity and organization he's now chair. He's deeply involved within the community in Bristol and has been a trustee for a number of charities. He's one of the key founders of African Voices Forum. Uh, Mr. Forward Masukuwatu, please, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Marius, for the uh, introductions. Uh, greetings, uh, brothers and sisters, friends, wherever you are. It's good afternoon, good uh, evening, uh, good morning. I just wanted to thank my other uh, colleague, uh, Sarah Lau, for a very good uh, reflective of the work uh, that you have been uh, doing in the Philippines. Um, but, you know, I'm from Bristol, which is a very international uh, city. We are a city of uh, about 100 languages and people from over you know, 187 countries of origin. And we are stand to be proud to be a city of sanctuary, a city that celebrates uh, diversity. Why am I saying this? It's because we see migration as, a, as an asset to the city. But more specifically to the discussion uh, for today, uh, we have uh, COVID-19 has exposed and exacerbated the pre-existing uh, inequalities uh, in Bristol. I'm pretty sure if some of you, you share similar experiences. But however, what we have done through our, our mayor, we also take our one seat approach, uh, which aims to make Bristol a, a welcoming and safe space for all. 
and tap into the talents that invest into our economic development, as well as uh, those who need uh, protection, as we are a city of hope and aspiration where everyone can share in its success. I also wanted to express our city's commitment to GCM or objectives, as well as uh, IMRF uh, principles. And what we have seen uh, during uh, COVID-19, uh, particularly is the, the revolution of generosity across uh, the city, uh, people wanting to help each other, whether it's from the migrant community, the, the local Bristolians and everybody. And so what we are saying as a city is to how do we harness the goodwill, that revolution of generosity that brings everybody uh, to, together and understanding that uh, we are dealing with people that also not only you know, living in Bristol, but who have a huge responsibility in, in uh, the countries of origin, where they come from, uh, where it might be incidents where they are you know, being affected by climate migration as an example. So we're really quite cognizant uh, that whatever we, we do here in the city is very important that we don't leave you know, everybody uh, behind. But it's not easy. It's, an, it's a challenge. And some of the challenges uh, that we experience at local level, as well as national and, uh, and international, has been shared by our colleagues. I will just focus specifically in our experience here in Bristol and the UK, partly is to do with national legislation and in specifically on immigration policy, which creates a hostile environment. In our case, where we have people who end up being migrants, being subjected to uh, a condition we call a no recourse to public funds. Why is it you know, important for me to mention that it's very in, uh, important because when people have been you know, working, uh, people have been really, you know, working so hard and supporting their family. But with COVID, obviously, unfortunately, some of the people had to lose their jobs. Uh, they have to lose their job. They don't have the right. So they don't have that access to welfare support, which uh, hinders heavily in terms of families, in, in terms of people's uh, health, mental health, as well as um, uh, rebuilding their uh, skills and careers to integrate uh, into the uh, community. So what do we do in terms of professional reskilling of our you know, migrant communities, both who are currently you know, arriving into the city? I've just given an example of where is our involvement with the Syrian resettlement, our involvement with the current uh, Afghan resettlement, as well as our existing uh, migrant communities is far back from the Windrush generation. We, we set up what we call a COVID race equality group, looking at specifically and understand that the impact of COVID had been really high within our migrant communities. We also work uh, very in, within our healthcare system. Uh, the majority of our people are nurses and doctors and etc. within from the migrant community. How do we you know, extend and ensure that um, uh, people are, are supported. So understanding uh, people's you know, experiences. So again, using our one city approach, we have people from uh, across the city and our partners to look at, you know, from a COVID race equality, how do we address the e e equality, you know, the equal race equality that has been, you know, exacerbated by the impact of COVID? Because we can talk about economic recovery but we cannot talk about it while we are not coming from the same level. So it was really important for us to engage our you know, universities, uh, engage our partners in having uh, this uh, conversation. We know also understanding that we have new communities that are coming from very difficult environment, people who have, uh, unfortunately, some would be you know, victims of um, um, modern you know, slavery, you know, exploitation, people have experienced, um, you know, trauma, people have experiencing, you know, mental health uh, issues. How would they start to rebuild their lives and career in, in, in Bristol? So it's really important for us to work with our partners to support a wrap around, support our, you know, migrant uh, communities uh, coming together. 
and also in terms of economic re recovery, we, you know, through support from our central government, uh, we also look at where uh, providing, you know, resources, you know, funding in, uh, within our high street support. We're focusing predominantly where we know into in our cities where there's a predominant um, a migrant community businesses from shops, you know, all those, you know, you know enterprises that we uh, see are probably in most of parts of the uh, of of the of the world. But we also targeted on those key areas to support our businesses that has been you know affected uh, not only providing our grants alone but also providing you know advice and support uh, knowing fully well that um, they would need uh, that kind of sort of support through our partners with you know uh, agencies uh, in the city within the voluntary sector so we realize that it is really in, in, in crucial that we need those you know you know resources we need there is a human resource base people are enterprising within our uh, migrant communities but they've been hit hard uh with um a covid a covid 19 and there's this lack of safety net where they are not able to you know access support as i say due to uh in a, in a national legislation which uh, hinders people to have you know access but our overall in a positive uh step that we have seen that the pandemic has shown us that we can not revert to business as usual it's not an option but actually these global issues help us to push us to uh especially cities to work together through partnerships sharing as well as uh learning from each other we also learn through our you know core cities uh within uk uh, as well as engaging uh, proactively uh, with, with with the government to see how we can uh, support uh, our communities, and also be you know as a city be on the forefront eh, because of our experience of our migrant communities within the city and become sort of the voice of of of, of wisdom, the voice of experience, the voice of those people who have lived the experience on the local level, in terms of shaping. Um, you know, national legislation in terms of it being on the discourse to understand what some of the challenges that people face. I'll give example on the health aspect here in the UK. People, you know, asylum seekers are in particular, they can receive a primary health care, but when it becomes to secondary uh, care, it becomes very difficult. They have to uh, to pay for their fees. So it's all those limiting, you know, things that hinder people to really be you know active players uh within within the city so it's really trying to ensure that um, we also advocate for uh, you know restrictive policies and guidelines that affect our delivery but we also you know champion that the need for our resources uh, particularly at local level which we say you know municipal financing is really critical because we have these aspirations at local level but we may not be limited in terms of, uh, you know, resources that we need. So it's mobilizing through our city partners as well as, you know, a, a lobbying uh, a na national and international through vehicles like uh, the mayor's migration council, where you know the mayor is in executive board, is to look at how collectively as, as as cities and as mayors we can have a unified voice and ensuring that whatever discussions that we have. That, that voice of lived experience is also important in terms of, you know, shaping uh, our responses in terms of shaping uh, policy, both at local as well as at national and international uh, level as such. Uh, we, we cannot uh, uh, move uh, on our own. Uh, we, we need, as um, Sarah, Sarah uh, alluded earlier on, that is really important that there is three global issues uh, the pandemic and racial you know inequality and the climate image you know that we have a lot in common as human beings so it is in, you know, important that uh we we don't look at our difference and, and as, as people we must treat each other with dignity and respect and uh, understand that uh, we can do much more collaboratively and together to support our uh, vulnerable people. I was just cited, uh, you know, a quick one example. Currently, where, you know, through our Afghan, you know, resettlement, where we work with the Department of Works to really help people to, 
you know, professional integration of providing them with training in terms of uh, job opportunities, in terms of entrepreneurship, one-to-one, those kinds of one-to-one uh, are support to help people to, you know, quickly integrate into, uh, you, know, co- you know, to the community so that they are able to, we tap into their skills, tap into their talent, which is beneficial for the vibrance of uh, our city as well as revisiting that revolution of generosity that has been outpouring during COVID and say, how do we move move forward collectively together as a city for people who are during the time of pandemic, we come together and support everybody without necessarily looking at the lens of migration or people's difference. How do we harness that? How do we move uh, together collectively? So our Hana City approach really help us to continue you know moving sort of that you know direction and develop a, a narrative as a city of sanctuary a city that gives try to give hope uh to to everyone and we cannot do alone as a local authority it's critical that we engage our local partners as well as uh the national uh government and we sit together on the table to look at the things that will help us to address uh some of the challenges that um our migrant communities might, you know, experience uh, regarding terms of, you know, health, in terms of uh, economic participation, in terms of language, because it's critical that we provide, uh, you know, e- you know, English uh, 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 to people to in order to to contribute in the society. And as much as we also uphold the contribution of that the diversity of the culture that is being brought into the city, but is also looking at, uh, you know, educational integration working with our educational institutions from schools uh, to universities and say, how do we ensure that we, we collectively take our individual step in making sure that we are indeed a real uh, city of sanctuary. But uh, also uh, at uh, uh, international level as a city, we, we, we work with other uh, you know, partners uh, globally because we realize that I think the voice of the city is critical in this uh, discussion in light of the pandemics that we all know and our experiences across across the globe it's important that it's being listened to how do we ensure that those voices of cities are at the center of you know decision making both within you know national governments and also at uh, you know at global in, you know, institutions to making sure that some of the city's aspirations can be fulfilled by opening up uh, resources that will enable us to navigate some of the uh, challenges you know, presented to us in terms of uh, national uh, legislation. So it's really you know, critical that we move forward. I was just, you know, in terms of conclusion, I will just give you one example uh, post COVID, our Women's Commission looked at specifically how do we move forward with our women, how they supported post uh, uh, COVID across uh, Bristol. So that study helped us to understand some of the impact that uh, COVID had done to uh, our, our women through that uh, piece of work. So it's really also looking down into how vulnerable are some of our women migrants uh, within our city, how they can be you know, supported. So in a nutshell, I would just really emphasize at uh, that point that uh, the pandemic has, learned us, has taught us to actually collaborative working and partnership and inspire that to hope to our migrant communities. Thank you. Back to you. Thank you very much to Mr. Forward Watson for his um, very important, interesting contribution, what they have been doing and achieved, what they have achieved in Bristol. Um, our third uh, panelist is uh, Mr. Charles Enesi. He is the founder and the president of the UN ECOSOC accredited Afro European Medical and Research Network. This is a network that brings together health practitioners in the diaspora to serve people in hard to reach villages and towns all over Sub Saharan Africa. He has an esteemed career, uh, several um, accolades and recognitions have been uh, have come his way over the years. Um, Mrs. Nessi will bring his experience and work at the AEMRN to improve the quality of life uh, of people 
uh, from low-income countries through innovative, sustainable means, and will bring this experience to us in the uh, in the uh, course of his presentation. Mr. Nesi, welcome, and looking forward to your presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marius. And um, <clears throat> it's a special pleasure for me to join this uh, esteemed um, forum for such a lively discussion. And as the moderator has already said, I'm Dr. Charles Senesi, I'm a physician, a migrant based in Switzerland. And I, I'm currently in Sierra Leone, joining you live from the IOM office. Just shows the way migrants we transverse the continent back and forth. And uh, indeed, uh, we have the Afro European Medical Research Network, which um, is a network of uh, health and health supporting professionals, health according to the WHO definition of 1948. And uh, which means we have a holistic approach to health. And so we use the network sort of as an entry point. We have members in all the continents around the globe and in almost every sub-Saharan Africa countries, we have so few inroads in North Africa. And the essence of the North Network is to share and exchange knowledge, and also to give back to our countries and continents of origin. How do we go about this? We organize symposia, workshops, etc., and in high-level countries, in Geneva, Switzerland, and in Bern, the federal capital where I stay, on topical issues that affect um, the, the welfare of migrants living in Switzerland, as well as in other European countries and countries around the globe. And then we sort of walk the talk by taking the outcome of these conferences and workshop onto the field to see how best we could leverage and improve the health care of people in low and middle income countries, especially the hard to reach population. And we do this by using um, a very innovative method we call the diaspora mission with more by clinics. We are in health professionals from all the disciplines, you name it, from the physicians, the surgeons, uh, the dermatologists, the midwives, um, the dentists, um, the, the eye specialists, the ear, nose, and throat specialists, the uh, epidemiologists, and uh, the laboratory technicians. We come together, together with other health supporting staff. You can be a lawyer, you can be um, an advocate. We all come together as a team and we go to a particular low and middle income country anywhere in Africa, but led by the local healthcare delivery system, i.e. the ministries of health. They are the custodians of the health of the world. And then we also align ourselves with um, international partners, for instance, the United Nations and the sub agencies such as the World Health Organization, so, so that we have an overarching agenda to make sure that our interventions in the low and middle income country is in line with the country's healthcare delivery system and policies, is in line with the WHO and also the United Nations, especially the Sustainable Development Goals, um, universal health coverage. We don't want anyone to be left behind. And we have been doing this for the past 25 years. And uh, so we, we align also with other groups across Africa, the WHO, Brazzaville, and the fourth ever conference. So we go to a particular country. That's what the best case scenario before this whole pandemic things uh, it started to disturb our operations. And uh, we join hands with the local healthcare delivery system and the doctors and the nurses, and we go to a very far remote village where we deliver our services. Well, first of all, we, we try to increase the healthcare, the awareness, health seeking behavior of the people. We, we, we amend certain health elements, for instance, surgical intervention for hernia, hernia repairs, hydro seal, um, just an enlargement of, of organs. And then anything that is actually affecting them. At the end of the day, um, we also take the younger doctors and nurses and midwives so that we can transfer, we can mentor the one-to-one, -one, we can empower their skills. That was the best case scenario. And there came the past years with the pandemic, first came the Ebola. And then most of us in the diaspora, we were hit hard because my country, Sierra Leone, was one of the biggest epicenters. And then it's Liberia and Guinea, we are all neighbors. And so we had to use our diaspora experience 
in, in that we could no longer come down directly physically to work on the ground. We could, I was able to recruit a lot of my colleagues through the WHO to make sure that we come down and they came to Sierra Leone. It's, 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 it's an incredible collaboration of South-South collaboration by colleagues in Kenya, where I've been working for the past 18 years. They joined hands with us, our colleagues from Uganda. And we, so we all, because they had a bit of experience in Uganda managing Ebola. So these are the sort of leverage we, we were able to bring on the table. I was also a consultant with WHO in Geneva in developing the guidelines for, for, the, for, for, for the Ebola, especially the PPA, the, the personal protective equipment. I was the chairman for one of the subgroups. And so we from the diaspora, we have seen on both sides of the eye. I was trained in Sierra Leone and living in Switzerland with such a huge network. So as his Efron said, the best pilot for a route is somebody who has worked with that route. So when we harness the diaspora in coming down to, 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 to join hands with our colleagues to say, hey, we are here to complement your effort. We did it with really Ebola. And then came again the, 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 the corona, the COVID-19. And learning from the experience of the, of the Ebola, which is what I believe in building up what, what we already had, the infrastructure of the Ebola, we were able to mount a response enough because um, um, the, the COVID-19 came, there was a short term of, of airport, everyone was closed. So we had to send money to support our colleagues, especially the frontline health workers. We have acute shortage of health workers in low and middle income countries. So our first response was to protect the little we had, because we lost so much during the Ebola. And uh, it worked. We are able to send money so that we can have hand sanitizer. The, the, the pharmacies learned how to make hand sanitizer without importing them, how to make face masks. So with the diaspora, we actually, through our media campaign, and set up a platform, we gathered money, we sent it down to the local and the colleagues, and they were able to mount a response in most of the African countries, which all goes well, that the diaspora can actually do a lot. And we have continued, despite the COVID-19, issues, it made it difficult for us to run our mobile clinics. But last November, we said, hey, we can no longer wait. And we it, it did class your first left US, UK, and Switzerland and other European countries, other colleagues in West Africa and other East Africa, Kenya, Nigeria, they joined hands with us. We came down to Sierra Leone and for about three weeks, we were able to run the mobile clinics again, bringing health to the people, increasing the health awareness, partner with our colleagues in the ministries of health so that at least we can have a comprehensive response laying the groundwork for this pandemic as we as it's gradually phasing out um, i'm based in switzerland and we have lifted most of the restrictions but here in sierra leone the restrictions are still a bit really hard which means we collaborate we learn from one another and we share experiences and then going forward we hope that such initiatives can be built upon there is a lot we can do. Most of us out in the diaspora, we tend, we tend to be the, like the opinion leaders. When we come there, they listen a lot to, to us. So what I'm going to do this is a free European Medical Research Network for short in form is that we also organize knowledge sharing um, events in Switzerland among the diaspora. Because when you empower them with information, when you empower them with knowledge, like the training of trainer, they are able to relate back to, to their countries or continents of origin when they go on holidays or to short-term missions. And that's also very crucial because we, are, we don't know it all, but we share our knowledge. We sort of synergize our efforts um, so that we can maximize the output and we leave no one behind. And uh, so I, I think more we come up with the questions and answers, but for now, um, that's my short presentation. We work with government as well because they are the custodians. We work with the WHO, they are the custodians of the health. So it means it's all inclusive and we have regular sessions at the United Nations in Geneva or New York, where I'm accredited, or the Austria. So we bring together the colleagues there. We have the ECOSOC status, which allows us to use free rooms. And also our colleagues in Asia, in the North Americas, in the South Americas, it's, it's, it's a huge network. We, work. we tend to sort of hold hands together because low, most countries, the low and middle income countries, we share the same identity, lack of healthcare, lack of basic amenities. It's only the, the, the value that, 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 that changes from one country to the other, from one continent to the other. But the bottom line is that we have the same lack of so basic indicators. So therefore we learn to work as a team. In either aspect of where you come from, we don't need to be the same to like one another to come, work towards a common vision. We should be defined by what is lacking in us among us in our communities and mount such a response. And we reach out to colleagues to emulate what Amrin is doing. And we hope 
that uh, we can build upon this initiative, especially in such pandemics as we prepare for any other pandemic that will come. Because history has taught us that it's a repetition of things that comes once in a while. We don't want it, but the reality is that trained epidemiologists, we have to be prepared. So we are laying the groundwork like we did before. And with that short intervention, I'm open to more questions and, uh, as we move forward. I thank you very much. Thank you so much to Dr. Charles Hennessy for this uh, very important contribution and the work done under the auspices of MRN. Um, I believe what uh, that we now have to hand the presentation for the moment back to Mr. Dejan Kesarovic to, to help facilitate the, um, uh, the panel part of our discussion. Thank you, Mr. Dejan Kesarovic. Thank you, Chair. At this moment, we have the three requests for intervention. The first one is Sara Katib from Solidarity Center, followed by Angela Maria Rosales from National Director of Soft SOS Children Village, Colombia, and followed by Maria Loen Gomez Sonet, Friends World Committee for Consultation. Sara, floor is yours. Um, thank you for the honorable speakers and thank you, uh, Mr. Moderator, for giving me the uh, opportunity to speak. Uh, my name is uh, Sara Al Khatib and I'm the field based migration specialist for the MENA region of the Solidarity Center, an international workers' uh, uh, rights NGO. Um, the failure to include migrants in social protection umbrellas is part of the architecture of global migration governance. The pandemic revealed the failure of labor migration systems around the world to protect migrant workers, especially that they are concentrated in the most affected sectors, which are the informal, unregulated, precarious, low-waged and unorganized uh, sectors in which migrant workers are ex excluded from the uh, protection of labor uh, legislations and contracts. Uh, these sectors are not subject to administrative control and labor inspection and access to justice uh, channels. We haven't seen serious uh, efforts to regulate these sectors. Business and employers resist any attempts and therefore these sectors are expanding and the number of workers deprived of social protections increases. Vulnerable groups of migrant workers work in these sectors, such as women, children, undocumented workers, and others. Though all migrant workers are potentially vulnerable as uh, they are excluded from labor law and social protection schemes that would support them. Only businesses and unscrupulous uh, employers benefit from the irregular migration and the expansion of the uh, informal economy sectors. The administrative corruption and weak migration governance allow them to uh, evade their responsibilities to provide so uh, social protection, which ultimately strains uh, states' budgets and threatens social and economic uh, stability due to the spread of poverty, famine, diseases, and uh, poor education. The current migration system uh, hinder the achievement of the SDGs. So we need a new global social contract that pays attention to labor migration and turns it into an opportunity to achieve the SDGs by abolishing the current uh, distorted migration systems, such as the sponsorship system in the Middle East, as an example, and creating a new global migration system that recognizes migrant workers across the world and in all sectors as workers, and that values their, and, uh, their work and great contributions in the social and economic development of countries, and allow them to practice freedom of association and collective bargaining. During the pandemic, leaders of migrant communities have played important roles in raising awareness about the virus and the vaccination and delivering humanitarian aid to those affected in these communities. If their efforts were organized through recognized unions and associations, this would have saved the world a lot of time, efforts and financial losses. Migrant workers should be recognized as key actors and main stakeholders in social dialogue. The international community must stand against any violation of freedom of assembly and association as one of the most important fundamental standards by binding for uh, uh, ILO member states. The creation of a new, better and fair labor migration system is an opportunity to address the drivers of uh, forced migration, such as poverty, unemployment, wars, crises, climate change and natural disasters. In order to protect the health and social systems of countries from collapse, especially in times of crisis, 
a new more fair and just labor migration system is an opportunity to create uh, uh, social protection systems that include migrants and social security that is portable, end of service, compensation, pensions, and maternity funds, and cover them with health insurance, occupational health and safety, uh, uh, protection from uh, occupational diseases, and compensation for work injuries. It is also an opportunity to organize the unorganized sectors and transform the informal economy into a formal economy with all what it takes from ratifying international conventions, the amendment and creation of national legislations and policies, bilateral agreements, uh, uh, strengthening law enforcement and access to justice, uh, cooperation of the international community to enhance accountability for all those who uh, deviate from uh, international standards, and cooperation in combating uh, administrative corruption and crimes of, uh, of forced labor. Migrant workers are workers, regardless of their uh, migration status, race, and uh, gender, and therefore are entitled to their full human and labor rights and social protections, recognizing their agency to act collectively and demand better wages and working conditions. Thank you for listening. Well, thank you, the Sarah Kati from Solidarity Center. And we'll like just remind, remind everybody, please speak on a reasonable pace because we need to translate everything properly. Now I'd like to give the floor to National Director of SOS Children Village, Colombia, Angela Maria Rosales. Hello, good day and a warm greeting to all. There are two pre-existing preconditions that need to be considered when analyzing the situation of migration in Colombia. One of them is the incapacity of the welfare system to provide protection and care to all children and families, where specific regions of the country are very impoverished and communities are highly risked continuously. These are communities that have been definitely left behind for many, many decades. These conditions are present in the majority of the country that uh, are actually the reception communities for migrants. The second condition is that Colombia still presents a high percentage of poverty and social violence, with numbers on the rise in terms of internal displacement, confinement, and social affectations due to the presence of armed groups that recruit and exploit teenagers and young adults. This challenges the capacity of the authorities and all the partners to guarantee protective environments for all children in the country. These two are the conditions into which children and families are migrating to. Since 2018, SOS Children's Villages Colombia has provided an emergency humanitarian response to the Venezuelan migration crisis with almost 2 million Venezuelan migrants and refugees in our country, as well as returned Colombians. Our actions have focused mainly on the protection, integration, shelter, and education in emergencies for the most vulnerable migrants, with presence in various regions of the country. The crisis caused by COVID-19 is another condition that is on top of the pre-existing situations that the country has lived. In, this increased the risk of migrants uh, to COVID-19 and, of course, the need to improve support to them with children and families on the focus. The migrants are the most vulnerable uh, population in risk of infection. They have less resources for the prevention of contracting COVID-19. They do not receive the same health services when they are affected or are in recuperation of the disease. Some of the major impacts that our work with children and families uh, can identify are the lack of stable income, for the children and families of migra uh, migrating children and families do not allow children and families to have access to water, to soap, or to face masks. These uh, are faced with COVID-19 with less opportunities of preventing the virus and then are of course more vulnerable. The irregular situation of them uh, limits their access to health services. Until 2021, about 56% of the migrants that do not have a legal condition in the country did not access the health service adequately. So the challenge that the pandemic has had in this population is not only in the general health system, but of course in the capacity of the health system to attend to more population and specifically to the migrant population. 
Migrants do not have access to regular health services, to medicines, or to treatments. And of course, uh, the situation of the pandemic postponed the capacity of uh, giving access to migrants to other services and only prioritizing the services of COVID-19. The so most affected are pregnant women and children. The living conditions of many migrant families are solved by sharing houses with other family groups. This generates overcrowding and is, of course, a very high risk for contracting COVID-19. Discrimination has also increased in many parts of the country since many people consider migrants as a possible transmitter of COVID-19. Access to education for children and young people through the pandemic was already a big challenge. Our uh, education service does not have the capacity to responding to all children in the country, but responding to children in migrant uh, condition is even a more or a higher challenge. With COVID-19, this challenge increased. All children had classes suspended for more than 18 months and the physical infrastructure was inadequate to guarantee social distancing in schools. This has delayed even more the capacity of migrant children to access education and to retake their opportunities of learning. This is a situation that affects almost 40% of the migrant children in the country. Children and, and youth that do not have access to education or recreation or uh, adequate services and activities are more on the street. This has increased, of course, their presence of cases of sexual abuse, exploitation, and risk of recruitment of the migrant children. We think from SOS Children's Villages in Colombia that the way forward is to center all responses to migration on children. They are the most vulnerable migrants. They are the most in needs. Families are the best way to articulate responses to the migrant populations. The affectation of COVID-19 has put many children at risk, and of course, the possibility of their families responding and protecting them has also decreased. There is also a high need to favor the nexus between emergency responses and development responses to support migrants on the move and to support those that have already settled in, in the country. We take this opportunity to thank IOM and all the UN system in the support that they have brought us in, to the migrating children and to the receptive communities in Colombia. And we also wish that our articulated work can continue improving the living conditions of thousands of children in the country. We recognize the great potential of migrants and the reception communities to generate solutions together. And we will always call for a clear focus on migrating children so that no child has to grow up alone and no boy, girl, or teenager is left behind. Many thanks. Thank you, Angelo, for giving us an overview of work of SS Colombia and, of course, what's happening currently in, 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 in Colombia. Uh, now I would like to give the floor uh, for Marisa Leon Gomez Sonet, Friends World Committee for Consultation. Yes, Marisa, thank you. Yours. Thank you, moderator, and the panelists for your interventions. The GCM contains a promise of participatory processes expressed in its emphasis on a people-centered, human rights-based, and whole-of-society approach to migration policy. Migrants must be included in a renewed social contract as proposed by the Common Agenda. However, inclusion of the most impacted should not only be at the receiving end. Migrants should be part of relevant international policy processes in a way that is ethical, sustainable, and safe while expanding meaningful participatory processes at the local, national, and regional levels. Additionally, in line with the common goal of leaving no one behind, states must address racism in migration governance. Racism, discrimination, and xenophobia are deeply entrenched in policy practices, leading to human rights violations and placing migrants in situations of vulnerabilities. The Quaker United Nations Office has published policy papers addressing these issues, providing recommendations and suggesting pledges. We would like to see these issues taken forward through the progress declaration, as well as in pledges. So my question is to, to the panelists, how do you think that the progress declaration can help operationalize commitments on participation, inclusion, and anti-racism? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have still four more uh, requests for intervention. Then I will ask our uh, future intervene to short the made their intervention, uh, you know, 
sum up as possible in two minutes if, if, if that will work. Next on the list is Portugal, followed follow by Nigeria, followed by Council of Europe, followed by Iran. Portugal, Gloria Sosa, floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Excellencies, colleagues, on behalf of Portugal, I would like to make a brief contribution on this panel. Portugal has long advocated for a human rights-based and whole-of-society approach to migration, promoting a positive narrative on migrants' contribution to societies. In this regard, our national efforts to address and recover from the pandemic fully take migrants on board, aiming at reducing and addressing migrants' vulnerabilities Particularly during the pandemic, in 2020, Portugal has granted temporary residence status to more than 350,000 migrants, providing them full access to health care and social support to enter into housing rental and employment contracts, to open bank accounts and to contract essential public services. These measures have removed the risk of arrest and detention. Migrants have also been included into our vaccination plan, regardless of their status. Moreover, Portugal has been strengthening integration measures, for example, through the National Network of Support Centers for the Integration of Migrants, functioning as one-stop shops and providing support in, in different aspects, regardless of legal status and free of charge. Finally, I would like also to mention the Welcome Guide for Migrants, published in December 2021, a guidebook designed to help public, private and civil society institutions and support migrants intending to live in Portugal. I thank you. Thank you, Portugal, for your intervention. Next uh, interim is coming from Nigeria. Pap Kanulatan, please. Thank you, moderator, for giving me the floor. Thank you for, for giving Nigeria the floor. COVID-19 revealed the fragile nature of humanity much more and precarious impacts on migrants and their families, bearing in mind the challenges in the immediate and long-term. In view of this, it has become very pertinent for national leaderships and the global community to put appropriate plans in place through new alliances for cooperation to address the root causes of migration, the conditions of migrant workers, offering legal pathways to migration and reintegrating irregular migrants into communities. Such envisaged alliances should work to ensure full inclusion of migrants in national preparedness and response plans and assist to collate, and re collate relevant information in applicable languages in line with national level preparedness. To achieve this, countries must act in concert by developing or strengthening humanitarian strategic plans through a whole of government approach and society approach. We must all work stridently to leverage on, 20, on objective 23 of the Global Compact on Migration and ensure that the progress made on this objective contributes to reducing the inequalities outlined in the 2030 agenda and to ensure that migration governance is considered a global good, truly, which leaves no one behind. In my country, Nigeria, a crucial foundation for the inclusion of persons of concern into national services has been highlighted to include issues such as education, health, water, sanitation, and hygiene, while also identifying the need to promote self-reliance within the national economic development framework. I should like to report that the government is finalizing its 2021 to 2025 medium term development plan where persons of concerns are incorporated and included in budgetary provisions for projects that address their challenges. Finally, and in response to the question of inequalities being at the root cause of migration, we must begin to recognize partnerships that focus on supporting development initiatives which, which leverage on many opportunities for the unemployed and the underemployed by improving platforms and opportunities to learn and share best practices. I thank you. Many thanks, Nigeria. Uh, our next scene uh, on the list is representative of the Council of Europe, Maria Ochoa. Maria, please, floor is yours. 
Thank you very much, moderator. Well, you know that uh, uh, speaking at the reasonable uh, pace is really a challenge for me, but I'll try to do my best and apologize uh, with the, the interpreters if I don't really manage. Um, uh, I already mentioned on uh, Monday the uh, five years action plan of the Council of Europe uh, uh, dealing with uh, the protection of uh, the most vulnerable migrants. Um, I would like to say that in the, uh, I'll try to, to stick to, to uh, to less than two minutes. Um, first, um, the challenges raised by the pandemic are also opportunities to better target our work based on the many lessons learned in the past years. Uh, so the action plan, which I already mentioned, contains important activities aimed at promoting fair access to healthcare, health literacy and practical guidance for social workers and health professionals working with migrants and refugees. We also address drug-related uh, challenges for refugees, migrants, and internally displaced persons, because at the Council of Europe, we have a, an intergovernmental body dealing with uh, drug prevention, which is called the Pompidou Group. And this uh, group conducts since 2010, a series of capacity building trainings, which are tailored for policymakers, but also for uh, professionals working with uh, um, refugees and migrants. Currently, 15 countries covering the world at large are part of this program. And uh, they are developing a handbook on guiding principles for professionals working with migrants and refugees in the field of addiction and drug prevention. And uh, we will let you know as soon as this uh, uh, handbook is uh, launched. In the framework of the third pillar of the action plan, the Council of Europe is developing tools to promote the inclusion and empowerment of migrants. And these tools also fit the scope of objectives 16 and 18 of the Global Compact for Migration. The project on uh, the European qualification passports for refugees aims to ease the integration of refugees who work by assessing their qualifications. So Support is also given to the practical implementation of literacy framework for migrants and refugees with none or low literate background. In that regard, our toolkit project seeks to strengthen the capacity of education systems to facilitate integration of children with migrant background. The integration of migrants and especially migrant youth to work and democratic participation continues also in the years to come. In this context, we strengthen our work on the implementation of the Committee of Ministers' recommendation on young refugees' transition to adulthood. And then, last but not least, we are working on uh, a recommendation to protect the rights of migrant refugees and asylum-seeking women and girls, which is expected to be adopted in the first half of this year. The draft recommendation includes a section of in on integration, calling on member states to highlight the contribution that migrants and refugees, girls and uh, uh, women bring to society, economy and culture in whole societies as a way to facilitate their integration and empowerment. Um, I'll just conclude by saying that the action plan also provides opportunities for multilateral cooperation in the field of human rights and migrant context, and we are happy and ready to examine concrete cooperation possibilities with external partners. And let me emphasize again, as I said already on Monday, that by implementing the action plan on protecting vulnerable persons in the context of migration and asylum in Europe, the Council of Europe contributes to the implementation of the Global Compact for Migration. I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Council of Europe. Our final uh, request for intervention uh, for this particular panel coming from Iran. Uh, Ehsan Mitterzam, please, the floor is yours. Uh, good morning and good afternoon, colleagues. Thank you, Mr. Moderator and the panelists and uh, previous speakers for their inspiring uh, presentations. My name is Ehsan Matin Razm from the Iran's mission in Geneva. I will try to be brief here. Iran has so uh, far long been a transit route as well as destination for displaced persons and migrants, including irregular migrants and other undocumented foreign nationals from neighboring countries. We have done our best to extend assistance to the migrants by providing educational health and medical services with a view to alleviating their suffering. By their full inclusion in the national COVID-19 response, 
We have ensured their free access to COVID-19 related tests and treatment. Iran has done it at its utmost to provide them with livelihood, access to job opportunities, free and inclusive education for children, health services and universal public health insurance and COVID-19 related assistance. Despite the fact that unilateral coercive measures alongside COVID-19 pandemic have adversely affected both Iran's hosting capacity as well as the socioeconomic well-being of migrants, all foreign nationals residing in Iran have been included in national vaccination plan irrespective of their legal status and approximately 4 million doses of vaccine have been administrated for them till now. Therefore, more than 77% of foreign nationals in Iran have been covered in the country's vaccination plan regardless of their special and social groups. Distinguished colleagues, we should consider the vulnerability in a holistic approach. Prioritizing certain groups among others is not in favor of these groups. We believe that considering cultural diversity and respect to the values and traditions of hosting communities is a key point for integration and promoting whole of society approach. Respecting the diversities is a mutual value and should be reciprocal in the context of migration. Considering these facts and belief would be effective on ensuring full migration in migrant inclusion and social cohesion and empower both migrants and communities in the COVID-19 response and other aspects of protection regime. I thank you for your attention. Many thanks, Iran. Iran. Now I would like to give the floor uh, back to Professor Olivier for the final words from him and from the panelists. Uh, thank you so much um, to our moderator of this particular um, panel discussion. Um, and uh, ladies and gentlemen, also to our esteemed speakers, I think we have heard many important messages. Uh, if I could try and summarize this on the one hand, we have um, taken note of innovative and comprehensive measures adopted by governments also in the, in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic but also otherwise. And uh, secondly, but quite importantly, increasingly the role of, of uh, the different range of stakeholders, including uh, in, the, in the private context, multilateral cooperation, uh, the diaspora, um, all with a view to leave no one behind as far as migrants in particular are concerned, and taking our cue, of course, uh, from the uh, uh, sustainable development goals, the uh, social contract uh, idea as um, reflected in the common agenda of the UN and of course the, the global compact on migration. Uh, it remains for me to ask our three panelists uh, literally within one minute each to, uh, to give their final views and maybe if they want to respond in that, within that minute to one or two of the questions that uh, or comments that may have been raised. Let's start in the same order that we have listened to our panelists and in the first place, the Under Secretary Sarah Lo Ariola from the Philippines. Over to you. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Professor. Um, the, I just like to respond to um, the, the, the question about the progress declaration and uh, where will it bring states. It is often said that the Global Compact for Immigration is the pathway to achieving the uh, sustainable development goals. And uh, in 2018, when it was adopted, a lot of people were hopeful, but uh, we were not sure where it would go. But uh, from 2018 to 2022, the, the Philippines um, has formed a lot of partnerships with uh, countries of destination. And there were many changes that happened for the good. And uh, we see that this is a product of the Global Compact for Migration. We are not looking forward to the Progress Declaration will serve as a benchmark to see how states are and will serve as an inspiration for all of us to do better. Um, from 2018 to 2022, there's a lot of things that have changed and we think uh, it has brought us a lot of hope in the midst of the pandemic. And uh, 
this this progress declaration will bring us forward so that we'll be able to have safe orderly and regular migration for all migrants regardless of their migration status. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you very much um, to you, um, Honorable Arivola, for um, this input. We ask again, Mr. Forward Masuwatsu, to uh, um, to talk to uh, you know any of the comments received, and to give his view. One minute to you, please, uh, Mr. Masuwatsu. Uh, thank you. My uh, response would be around sort of commenting on on racism, really, and I think it's important that um, in all discussions we have, particularly in the governance of migration, we uproot racism and it's everywhere. The, the othering and the closing and tightening of borders, that language I think is critical for all of us to really look at. We are all people. That's the fundamental question that we need to, to address. And those in the corridors of power should be a beacon of hope in terms of the language they use that design, you know, divide us. So I think it's really important that we don't have to shy away and accept and acknowledge the deepness and the pain that is, uh, you know, reducing inequality in terms of, so far as racial inequality is concerned, because that's how, you know, policies are being crafted to define people into certain categories and in as much as we want to have you know cities that embrace but i think racism is really critical that we confront it we you know educate people we make sure that we also listen to the voices of people that have been at the receiving end of racism so i think it's opening that safe space for dialogue is critical thank you Thank you for this very important contribution that you have made. Uh, finally, Dr. Charles Senesi, over to you. One minute. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, uh, the moderator and all the participants. And um, indeed, I will build upon the, one of the questions: How can we, as migrants, be part of the recovery process? And uh, I always say. For instance, the Switzerland experience, as we have to organize ourselves as migrants so that at least we can be a force to reckon with and engaging this government over a lot of issues. And um, taking my team also to different African countries, um, if you go to Rome, you do as the Romans do. So it's for us, the migrants, to really understand the culture of the countries we come to. Yes, racism exists. Well, let's do our level best to align our values with the values of whichever country be you in Nigeria, in Sierra Leone, in Switzerland, in the UK. I walk around all the globe. And in the context of COVID, it is my wish that we continue to support one another and uh, raise the bar so that the migrant population can be included in all of the initiatives that concerns them. Because they know where the shoe um, bonds better, Germans know where the shoes uh, bonds better. So with that, I hope we continue the dialogue and we are like think tankers for our communities so that we can access their problems, bring them to a broader, 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 broader platform, sorry. And I thank you very much. And we look forward for further engagement. I thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Senesi. Um, esteemed colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, we um, have come to the end of this um, uh, an instructive session. Uh, the first panel of today on migrant inclusion covered 19 recovery and social protection, a renewed social contract. Um, despite all the challenges experienced by migrants and migrant workers, we've heard about uh, very important steps taken by governments and other role players in the COVID-19 context, um, as far as social protection in particular is concerned. And the lessons that are there for us to take forward in this regard uh, and um, in that process to, to lean very heavily on the guiding frameworks that, that are out there um, in the common agenda with its uh, emphasis on the, on the social contract and uh, in particular as well, the global compact on migration as was well remarked by our first panelist from, from the Philippines that uh, it was a moment in time or in history, which has now become a movement. And I think we see some of that 
in the response of, of governments and other role plays in the COVID-19 context for us to take all of that forward, not just as a uh, discourse, but certainly as, as a matter of uh, practice and policy. Um, I greet you. I thank you for your participation, and I wish you a um, successful further deliberation in the course of the IDM, the last day of the IDM today. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you to all panelists and participants for the panel one on, on our work. And a special thanks go to moderator, Professor Olivier, as he actually working with, with us from Australia, where it's now 2 a.m. And really, thanks a lot for being with us in such an early hour, not actually that late. Now we are uh, slowly, but not slowly, quickly transiting to panel two. What is the rethinking skilled migration to address persistent labor shortages? And I would like to give the floor to I am Deputy Director General for Management Reform, uh, Ms. Amy Pope. Amy, the floor is yours. Thank you so much um, and welcome, IOM member states, our guest speakers and our audience to the very last panel of day three. Today's conversation is about rethinking skilled migration to address persistent labor shortages. It's also the very last session of our first international dialogue on migration this year, which has been guided under the overarching theme of global compact for migration implementation in practice, successes, challenges, and innovative approaches. As you guys know, this IDM is our best forum for bringing together the migration policy dialogue. We bring together policymakers and practitioners from around the world. And this year, the IDM is contributing to the International Migration Review Forum. We're providing space to assess and gather relevant data, evidence, evident, effective practices, innovative approaches, and recommendations as they relate to the implementation of the Global Compact for Safe, Orderly, and Regular Migration. This is an exciting panel today. We're gonna to take a closer look at the objective number five and 18. And that promotes the availability and flexibility of regular pathways for various categories of migrants, including those in need of protection, as well as recognizing the skills and the qualifications and the competences that migrants bring to the table. We are seeing around the world that countries lack workers to maintain critical infrastructure and economic productivity. We saw it specifically with regard to COVID-19. The lack of available healthcare workers was present throughout the, the United States and other countries in the world. But at the same time, there are tremendous uh, uh, labor qualifications, criteria, skills that we're seeing across the world, and we haven't fully taken advantage of it. There's been momentum around the skills-based mobility and skills mobility partnerships. These are basically agreements between states where they commit to joint skills development and mobility pathways so that we promote human capital formation and positive labor market outcomes. They provide a much needed opportunity for safe, regular and orderly pathways for various categories of migrants and bring together the stakeholders that really enable the opportunities that migration provides. The good news for employers in destination countries is that they get a foreign workforce that is tailored toward their specific skills needs. And the origin countries gain from an enlarged pool of workers with in-demand skills, technology, technology transfers, and investments in the education and the skills of its workers, which then allows migrants to fulfill their potential in those pathways. Unfortunately, to date, we're just not taking advantage of the tremendous diversity of skills and experiences that migrants bring to the table. And we haven't fully realized the potential that is available and the opportunities that migration presents. So that's why this, this particular session is so exciting to me. This is the future of migration. This is how we make the case for migration to communities around the world. This conversation today brings together some tremendous panelists who have good news to report. They have experiences that they're going to share with you. They have lessons learned. 
And we'll have first an opportunity for them to present that information to all of you, and then a discussion, because we want you as the audience to engage in the conversation. And then of course, we'll give our panelists the opportunity for final statements. As always, they're going to, there will be simultaneous interpretation in English, Spanish, and French available throughout the meeting. So we encourage you to become an active part of this conversation and contribute to what is an incredibly dynamic conversation that is happening right now here at the IDM. So enough from me. Let's now introduce the speakers. We have three tremendous speakers who happen to be all women, uh, not on purpose, but um, a wonderful, wonderful group of people. Um, first is Marion Campbell Jarvis. She's the Assistant Deputy Minister for Strategic and Program Policy in Canada at the Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship Canada. She's going to talk to us about some of the programs that they've undertaken in Canada and some of the lessons learned. We then have Avni Kar. She's the head of the International Collaborations and Corporate Strategy at the Indian National Skills Development Corporation, who's going to share their perspective on the importance of skills development and certifying Indian workers to go overseas. And finally, Helen Dempster. She's a policy fellow and assistant director, Migration Displacement and humanitarian policy at the Center for Global Development, who will speak about some of these global skills partnerships and how to avoid the effects of brain drain while at the same time allowing origin countries to benefit from the skills and the experiences of migrant workers. So with that, I'm going to stop talking and I'm gonna turn it over to Marianne Campbell Jarvis from the government of Canada uh, to open the conversation. Go ahead, Marianne. Oh, thank you so much, Deputy Director General Pope. Um, it's a lovely introduction, and it's certainly an honor and a pleasure to share this time with the other panelists and, and to be speaking to this audience. I would like to first acknowledge that since I'm joining you from Ottawa, Canada, that I am on the traditional territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe people. And for those joining from the traditional lands of other Indigenous peoples, we honor those Indigenous peoples as well. Before I begin my remarks, I would like to touch on what is happening in Ukraine. It's hard to uh, speak without thinking about this. Very extremely disturbing to Canada and to many other countries. And as part of Canada's response to what our Prime Minister has called an egregious attack, we are leveraging our immigration levers to provide support. Looking at the current global picture, as we move towards the first International Migration Review Forum in May of this year, it is clear that COVID-19, I know we're all fed up of talking about it, but it is very clear that it has had a dramatic impact on migration worldwide. Travel restrictions and the closure of borders have reduced the possibility for migrants to travel. This has made clear to many of us just how important migration is for our economic development and to fill our labor market needs. There is a great deal of positive information and data about the contributions of migrants, particularly the significant social and economic contribution that immigration brings. And as Deputy G Director General Pope alluded in her introductory remarks as well. As a champion country, of the Global Compact for Migration. I do want to touch upon Canada's work on labor migration pathways and the economic benefits they provide to host communities and to migrants themselves. We do see considerable economic benefits from our regular migration pathways. Allow me to share just a few statistics to show how much migration is interwoven into the fabric of Canadian society. One in three Canadian business owners, uh, sorry, one in three Canadian businesses is owned by an immigrant, and one in four healthcare workers is a newcomer. Immigrants make up 37% of pharmacists, 36% of physicians, 39% of dentists, 23% of registered nurses, and 35% of nurse aides. Immigration currently accounts for almost 100% of Canada's labor force growth. Roughly 75% of Canada's population growth comes from immigration, 
mostly in the economic category. In fact, by 2036, immigrants will represent up to 30% of Canada's population compared with 20.7% in 2011. Canada has a mi managed migration model and is a strong proponent of safe, orderly, regular pathways. As part of this, we have an annual rolling three-year levels plan. And in 2021, the government set an ambitious target of welcoming 401,000 new permanent residents. Just for baseline comparison, it's 341,000 in 2019. So you can see that was, was quite a, a growth. Canada exceeded its target, in fact, and welcomed 400 and 500,000 new permanent residents last year. This is the most newcomers in a year in Canadian history. And last month, Minister Fraser announced Canada's immigration levels plan for 2022 to 2024, setting further bold new immigration targets. This plan aims to continue welcoming immigrants at a rate of about 1% of Canada's population really to help fill those critical labor market gaps and support a strong economy into the future. So to state the blindingly obvious, immigration with the borders closed and travel restrictions worldwide was pretty challenging. So we made the most of the talent already within our borders in ways that supported Canadian businesses and migrants themselves. The majority of the new permanent residents in 2021 were already in Canada on temporary status. In 2021, Canada opened an innovative pathway to, um, for permanent residents, for temporary residents, for over 90,000 temporary workers in essential occupations already employed in Canada, as well as to recent international graduates. This pathway provided permanent status to these temporary residents who possess the skills and experience we needed to fight the pandemic, recover from the pandemic, and accelerate our economic growth, as well as having the international graduates who are driving the economy of the future. One of the things, if you kind of know the geography of Canada, vast country, couple of big cities, and most migrants are really attracted to our three largest cities, Toronto, Montreal, and Vancouver. And so given the demographics and labor shortages in smaller centers or more rural and remote areas, we have developed measures to help spread the benefits of economic immigration across the country. One such pathway is the Atlantic Immigration Program which we launched as a pilot in 2017 and actually became a permanent feature of our system this year. The program is successful in attracting and perhaps most importantly, retaining skilled immigrants and recent international graduates to meet the unique labor and economic needs of the Atlantic region of Canada. Another effort that we've undertaken is the federal immigration pilot for rural and Northern communities which we launched in 2019 to help smaller communities welcome migrants who will fill labor shortages in remote communities. Rural communities employ over 4 million Canadians and account for almost 30% of our national GDP and supply food, water, and energy to our urban centers, sustaining the industries that contribute to Canada's prosperous economy. Piloting and permanently phasing in innovative pathways have allowed Canada to further test policy and program changes designed to increase the retention of newcomers in these regions and drive economic growth. One of our lessons learned is that having a job is really, really important, but equally important is the welcoming community to support that integration, to make people want to stay. Complementary pathways for skilled refugees are another area of innovation and we think transformation. With many countries closing their doors to refugees over the course of the pandemic, we continue to offer the world's most vulnerable protection in Canada 
while concurrently seeking innovative measures to harness their skills, talents, and desires to contribute to their new communities. We have, con we have expanded the concept of refugee mobility from a solely humanitarian focus to one which includes mobility based on refugee skills, abilities, and other attributes alongside protection. We created the Economic Mobility Pathways Pilot to allow skilled refugees who can fill specific labor market needs in Canada to arrive not as refugees, but to arrive in land as economic immigrants. This helps to change the narrative on refugees by focusing on their skills, their education, their experience, rather than just their vulnerability. Through the Economic Mobility Pathway Pilot, candidates can apply for permanent residence through existing economic immigration pathways with some facilitation. We recognize that complementary pathways are new tools for refugee protection, and that while we have many lessons to share, we can also learn from others experimenting in this area, such as Australia and the United Kingdom. This is why Canada agreed to chair the Global Task Force on Refugee Labour Mobility, which will bring together all of the partners needed to implement labour complementary pathways, governments, civil society organisations, employers and international organisations to collectively explore ways to scale up these initiatives and encourage others to adopt and adopt them. We're currently working with the UNHCR, with the IOM, the Government of Australia and other partners to launch the Global Task Force on Refugee Labour Mobility in April. And we hope to attract participation from any and all interested stakeholders. If you'd like more information on this, please don't hesitate to contact me. Based on this model, Canada, in concert with the international community, is exploring innovative means to um, expand complementary pathways for refugees as a means to increase access to protection in third countries, in addition to traditional resettlement pathways. They also support the global compact for migration in expanding safe and regular migration pathways. I want to conclude my remarks by just mentioning that Canada will continue welcoming newcomers who bring the skills our economy needs to grow and recover from the global pandemic. Economic immigration helps Canada to stay competitive and to attract talent from around the world. Immigrants bring unique skill sets, innovative ideas, and global experience, which help your economy and our society. In turn, Canada provides an opportunity for migrants to apply their skills, talents, and make meaningful contributions. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I just want to acknowledge how forward-leaning Canada has been in identifying durable solutions and making this match that we're talking about here today, um, where we're providing labor mobility pathways for displaced migrants, but it actually benefits Canadians and helps to uh, promote uh, Canadian economic well-being as, as well. So it's really, you're really a leader. So thank you for doing that. Um, and obviously, as we all know, that's part of GCM objective number five. So you're living it and it's great to see. I'd like to turn now to Dr. Avneet Kaur from the, uh, the Indian National Skills Development Corporation. Dr. Kaur, I'll leave it to you. Sure. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks first to IDM for uh, organizing this absolutely brilliant and uh, very tough session, uh, which brings people from across the globe together. Thank you, Amy, for beautifully setting the context for this panel. And uh, thank you for the opening uh, remarks. Uh, um, I'm part of uh, the Ministry of Skill Development and Entrepreneurship Government of India. National Skill Development Corporation is an agency that supports the mission of uh, Skill India International, and I will be uh, speaking from the other perspective. So we just heard uh, from her in the perspective, which is a destination country perspective. And of course, Canada is hailed as a global example, like you also acknowledged. Uh, I am on the other side. Uh, I'm, uh, you know, the country of origin. So uh, when I talk about what the objective of the Skill India International mission is, um, uh, I speak from the perspective of India becoming a global source for quality talent, leading to global job opportunities for Indians. 
also providing international career mobility opportunities for Indians who are already settled overseas and to create internationally benchmarked qualifications. So those are the three broad areas that fall under the mission of Skill India International. The entire focus here is on ensuring mobility of skilled and certified workers across blue collar and white collar job roles in destination markets. So for India, the traditional markets include, of course, the entire GCC region. Then there is the UK and the European markets and markets with mature migration systems such as Canada, Australia, Japan and Singapore. Uh, and while we do this, uh, while we transact this so-called business of mobility, uh, there is, of course, there are a lot of government-to-government -government, uh, uh, partnerships in the form of uh, these mobility agreements that you spoke about. So we have two dozen odd such partnerships. We also engage at a B2B level with several other stakeholders. Uh, but the entire aim of these partnerships and these engagements is to ensure that we are creating value for all stakeholders in this process. And the key stakeholder is, of course, uh, the candidate uh, herself. Uh, so from a candidate's perspective, we want to make sure that they are most importantly skilled and certified. Uh, they um, have the requisite uh, orientation in terms of the culture, uh, any foreign language uh, that they need to um, uh, get updated with before they move to the destination country, uh, life skills and general orientation and counseling, which is very critical. Uh, and most importantly, uh, like I had said earlier as well, we want to make sure that it's only skilled and certified people who undertake these mobility opportunities so that once they are in the destination country, there is, uh, you know, they do not, uh, they're not at a loss. They are treated at par with the others. Second is also to make sure that there is value here for the employer, because at the end of the day, it's, it's a business for the employer. They are seeking employees who are able to fulfill certain tasks. So the employer should uh, feel that there is value in uh, the entire recruitment and placement facilitation process. Uh, they have the available skill sets here. And there's also some support in the form of visa rebates that uh, some countries have introduced to encourage employers to hire skilled and certified uh, candidates from certain countries. Uh, and finally, for the government of India, uh, it enables uh, us to achieve social and economic impact through improved incomes of migrating workforce and remittance transfers, of course, and opening up of new markets for skilled migrant workers through pilot implementation and scaling up. So uh, NSTC has undertaken several initiatives, and uh, one such is uh, with the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, where we did a benchmarking and harmonization uh, exercise. So this becomes very significant when we speak about mobility. Uh, this ensures that the standards are uh, recognized between the two countries and uh, introduces a sort of uh, level playing field and uh, mutual acceptance. Uh, uh, at, at various levels. One is, of course, there is the technical acceptance, but with technical acceptance also comes, uh, you, you, you know, the added things about social acceptance, et cetera. You can uh, really link this uh, with many other dimensions. So we have undertaken this uh, exercise with, like I said, with the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, where we have benchmarked around 20 uh, odd qualifications between the two countries, and this eases the mobility process. We also uh, undertake this exercise with several other countries, but it's mostly in the uh, uh, stage of certain pilot projects that are being implemented right now. Uh, so uh, some of the challenges, uh, you know, and I'll end with that, that uh, some of the challenges that we face as a country of origin is um, in terms of legal pathways for mobility. So that there is not enough that is available uh, from the perspective of India for uh, people to uh, migrate to different countries. Uh, and it's also very complicated. So easing some of those restrictions, making sure that there is enough uh, awareness uh, uh, and this information is readily available. And there's a lot of work that we have to do at a G2G level to make sure that uh, you, you know, the bottlenecks are eased and uh, correct information is disseminated. Uh, second is the mutual recognition of standards, both in terms of skills and education. Uh, and uh, third is uh, something that we spoke about earlier as well uh, during one of our internal sessions, uh, you know, sharing the burden of the costs, because in this case, it's not it's not only the, uh, uh, you know, the burden on the country of 
for our origin to make sure that the candidates have the required skill sets, have the required life skills, the foreign language skills, the technical skills, because at the end of the day, they are actually contributing to the society and economy of another country. So I think it's only fair and it makes sense that both countries, the respective countries, are able to participate in ensuring that uh, the uh, candidates undergo the right training and acquire the right sort of cultural dimensions that they need to live a fruitful life in the destination country. Uh, and at present, these things are extremely expensive. So if there is a need for international assessment and certification, um, uh, the kind of rates that are charged by some of the uh, you know, uh, international assessment and certification agency, the dollar rates, don't really work well in the context of developing countries. So we really need to look at partnerships where they are able to set up institutions within India, for instance, uh, in partnership with an organization such as NSDC that would uh, ensure that uh, one, the, there is real access and two, costs are also reduced uh, um, and ease mobility in a lot of different ways. So there are a lot of innovative uh, options that need to be considered uh, to make sure that it is, um, it is a level playing field uh, that uh, uh, you know the politics, the economics, and uh, from a social perspective, everything is tied well together. Uh, so thank you. I, I'll stop there and look forward to the rest. Thank you so much. And of course, the NSCDC, the NSDC, is a really great example of how we can use public-private partnerships to make sure that workers are trained and that they have the skills they need um, in order to really uh, take advantage of the opportunities offered by employers. And of course, this is a great example of GCM objective number 18. Uh, this is where we get the mutual skills recognition so that the skills certification is really a critical piece to making this all work. I'd like to now give the floor to Helen Dempster at the Center for Global Development. Go ahead, Helen, it's, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. Good morning, good afternoon, and many thanks to the IDM for having me here, especially for an all-female panel, which I'm always excited to be on. So as Deputy Director Pope mentioned, I've been asked to talk to you today about skills mobility partnerships and how better aligning skills development and migration can contribute to development in countries of origin. So skills mobility partnerships can take many forms and have many different names. Though at their heart, there's an emphasis on better linking skills development in countries of migrant origin and migration itself. So they definitely aim to realize the goals of the Global Compact for Migration, promoting safe, orderly, and regular migration pathways, and providing migrants with decent work opportunities, both at home and abroad. So typically, these partnerships involve five different components. Firstly, formalized state cooperation. Secondly, multi-stakeholder involvement. Thirdly, training. Fourthly, skills recognition. And finally, migration or mobility. So in my mind, this focus on increasing skills within countries of origin is very welcome. For too long, countries of destination have neglected to place a strong focus on the development impact of their migration pathways. Many turn to remittances, pointing out the incredible development power of financial, skill, and technological transfers that migrants send home. Yet I would argue that solely relying on remittances is not enough for two main reasons. Firstly, they do little to combat brain drain, a frequent and justifiable concern of countries of origin, especially within sectors with a shortage of skilled personnel like healthcare. Secondly, countries of origin are realizing the strong bargaining power that they have in these negotiations. If countries of destination are to secure skilled personnel to meet labor shortages, they need to give something meaningful back. There are, of course, many different ways to enhance the development impact of migration pathways, and better linking them with skill development is an excellent way to go. Within the context of these pathways, Countries of destination should seek to financially and technically support whatever development aims the country of origin has. This could be things like investing in training and education systems, upgrading curricula and skill recognition, 
supporting the development of migration management systems, policies, or data, buying equipment and upgrading physical infrastructure, experimenting with schemes to encourage the recruitment and retention of workers, or providing general aid and budget support for other priorities. Such a focus definitely helps build a partnership of truly equal partners and encourages better state cooperation between countries of origin and destination. So one way to do this is through implementing a global skill partnership. The global skill partnership model was invented by my CGD colleague, Michael Clements, back in 2014. We worked very closely with the drafters of the Global Compact for Migration to get this link between skills and migration recognized in Objective 18. And as a result, Global Skill Partnerships were one of the only concrete policy recommendations included within the Global Compact. Essentially, a Global Skill Partnership is a bilateral labor migration agreement between equal partners. So the country of destination agrees to provide technology and finance to train potential migrants with targeted skills in the country of origin before they move. And they then get migrants with precisely the skills they need to integrate and contribute best upon arrival. The country of origin provides that training, but they also get support for the training of non-migrants as well, which increases rather than drains human capital. So the defining feature of the Global Skill Partnership model is what we call this dual track approach. Basically, at the start or during the training, trainees can pick which track they want to go down. They can stay in the home track for non-migrants or the away track for migrants. Those who choose to stay are plugged back into the local labor market with increased skills and earning potential. This helps ensure that the country of origin benefits from a brain gain rather than a brain drain. Those who choose to move obviously also have these increased skills and earning potential, and they also have the ability to migrate legally and safely. They could also be provided with additional training and soft skills, things like languages or other facets of integration. Of course, circularity could also be encouraged as part of this model, further contributing to brain gain. The Global Skill Partnership model is being trialed around the world. Belgium has been using the model to train ICT talent across North Africa. Australia is using it to train for a variety of vocational skills in the Pacific Islands. Germany is designing construction and engineering partnerships with a number of countries of origin across the globe. And recently, we worked with the World Bank to design a number of global skill partnerships with Nigeria, many of which we expect to be implemented soon. Now, my final point is to say that in the implementation of this model, we're learning a lot. How to choose partner countries and which sectors to work in, how to bring all partners on board, both substantively and financially, especially the private sector and employers, how to work across government departments, countries and a range of different entities to try and align priorities and objectives, how to pilot, test, monitor, evaluate and scale the model. So I'd be very happy to go into depth on any of these points in the Q&A, um, but please do get in touch if you would like to learn more. And thank you again very much for having me here. Thank you so much. Um... I think this is really exciting work that you're doing and we'll definitely ask you a few questions about how it plays out in real life to follow up. Uh, now is the exciting part of the conversation. We go from presentations to engagement. And so I do welcome folks who are listening in. Um, if you're interested in, in having being part of this conversation, uh, please do feel free um, to join it. Um, I'm going to exercise my prerogative as the facilitator to start the conversation. Um, and if you don't mind, Assistant Deputy Minister um, Jarvis, can, can you say a bit more about how migration systems can be better leveraged so that we can serve migrants or refugees who have special protection needs um, and make sure that those needs are recognized and, and uh, respected even as they're being 
put into these partnerships to uh, where their skills can be further developed or contributed to the economy? Well, thank you so much um, for, for that question. It's a, it's a good one and an important one. Um, I think what we're really looking towards are um, the establishment and creation of, of complementary pathways. Um, and I spoke about one, which is really leveraging the skills and the experience of, of refugees um, to come as economic um, immigrants, but there are certainly other pathways, whether as, as students um, coming forward or um, as the private, through private sponsorship that um, Canada has had in place for, for some time. But I think it's also really the emphasis and availability of regular pathways, because I think what, what we all see is there are refugees who do not have a durable solution, who have fled persecution and are seeking protection. We also have economic migrants that are on the move that sometimes find themselves in situations that actually turn into what we would almost associate as fleeing persecution and in need of protection. And so leveraging the existing economic pathways is also a really important part of, of the solution. And so um, I, I thought what uh, Helen was speaking about, that kind of upskilling um, is helpful as part of that brain gain, but it also allows access to a greater number of regular pathways with that upskilling. So the, there are multifaceted pieces of, of this solution. Um, and, uh, but I think complementary pathways along with our regular um, uh, pathways are really important. And I, I want to just touch on the other end of the spectrum very briefly is, is that settlement integration, um, which really allows the successful upskilling of language, of finding jobs, of support for families, for education, um, that that further enhances that experience. So, so really across the whole continuum. I saw your um, comment, even as we were preparing um, for this discussion about the importance of language was really critical. And we see that play out around the world without language skills, um, we see much, you know, the, the success of these programs is is really uh, much more difficult. So that's a useful um, sort of takeaway, I thought, from from some of Canada's uh, experience here. Um, if I could ask Dr. Cower, um, I, could you just say a little bit more about how you're engaging with the private sector? I mean, how do you really anticipate what skills? How do you make sure um, you have this cooperative relationship? Just if you don't mind, just maybe even taking a real life example of where it's worked um, so that we can have a kind of very practical sense of how this could play out elsewhere. Sure, thanks. I think that's, uh, that's an important question. Um, uh, at the end of the day, when we talk about uh, migration of skilled and certified uh, workers, to destination countries, they need to be employed, and that, so we, are, you know, without a proper linkage with the private sector, uh, where this discussion is incomplete. Uh, the first uh, step towards that is uh, the traditional way of, uh, you know, conducting a study. So we we've, we've had a global skill gap study that was conducted a couple of years ago uh, that mapped the opportunities for Indian migrants across uh, 15 uh, to 20 top countries uh, in the coming few years uh, across sectors and job roles. Uh, so that was a that was more of a macro view of where the opportunities are uh, to enable us to prepare on the supply side. Uh, the second is that we are in the process uh, of actually doing a more detailed uh, micro level study across identified countries. So again, we have identified 15 to 20 potential countries for Indian migrants, uh, uh, where we are expecting to see results in uh, two to three months actually. Uh, and uh, this would focus on various aspects. Uh, one, of course, who are the large employers, what what are the jobs, what are the sectors, what are the skill sets that are required, um, 
uh, foreign language uh, requirements uh, and the usual things, what are the immigration pathways. So this is the level two information where we are trying to get uh, you know, to talk directly with the employers, with the recruitment agents in the destination countries to understand what their needs are and then how can we collaborate to fulfill those needs. And like I said, it has to be, and that was really important what, uh, you know, what Helen mentioned as well, that it has to be a collaborative uh, exercise between the two countries rather than uh, for, for the country of origin to uh, try to completely understand what the requirements are and to meet those requirements. So that's how we are uh, uh, for now engaging with various partners. Uh, and just as an example, as a live example, so we are working with this uh, uh, organization in Western Australia. It's called Herdeman Global Services. And uh, they, they are immigration consultants and recruitment agents there. So we have a requirement of 500 uh, skilled people that they need from India across few job roles. Uh, they are the ones who are getting in touch with the employers. We are managing the supply side from here. So uh, advocacy awareness, uh, sourcing the right candidates, ensuring they have the required training, making sure that the very expensive vet assess certification is also in order. That's the part that, uh, and of course, the end the mile of immigration, the documentation, et cetera. So we are working with this organization. Uh, we've tied up, we have an MOU with uh, the Spurban Global Services in Australia, where this is a live project, one of the live projects that we are working on. That's great. That's really useful. Um, if I could turn to Ms. Dempster, uh, for a moment. So I love this idea of brain circulation. And of course, um, we know Michael Clemens well and the concept of the Global Skills Partnership. Um, can you give some examples of how you've had the brain circulation play out? I mean, I think we have a great, great um, uh, sense of what you're doing in terms of training and matching, but then in terms of contributing back to the origin country uh, lessons learned or examples of where it's worked really well, that'd be super, thanks. Yeah, of course. And hopefully it was clear from my remarks that I would say the Global Skill Partnership model is not necessarily trying to facilitate either temporary or permanent migration. This is down to the desires of the country of origin and the country of destination. Personally, I would say that if there are large shortages within professions on both sides, and if the country of destination has invested years and substantial financial capital to be able to train people, then it probably makes sense to try and encourage permanent migration as part of that scheme. Otherwise, it might seem like more of a political difficulty to argue for the sort of the justification of that scheme politically at home. But there's no reason why you couldn't look to some form of partnership, which is more of a long-term temporary partnership. And there are many countries that are doing this. For example, Northern Australia at the moment is training aged care nurses in the Pacific Islands, and they will be eligible for a three-year visa in Australia before returning back home to their country of origin. So different countries have employed different models. Um, in terms of the sort of tangible benefit to the country of origin that you mentioned, I think Probably quite one of the best examples we have at the moment is the partnership between Belgium and Morocco. Um, this project, which was called Palim, I can send you through more details, has been implemented over the last couple of years. The aim there was to try and train 120 young Moroccans. These were people who were unemployed, people who didn't have any previous ICT skills, but were interested in working in the ICT field. Belgium paid for the training of these people within Morocco. They worked on a nine-month training program and a number of digital skills that were in need both in Morocco and in Belgium. And this is the critical part of the model. At the end of the scheme, the aim was that 40 of these young Moroccans would move to Belgium. And these 40 were chosen through a competitive selection process by Belgian companies Simultaneously, there was also a competitive selection process by Moroccan companies of the other 80 graduates. Now, unfortunately, COVID disrupted the actual migration part of this program. Um, they finished their training just as COVID kicked off and the borders closed. But thankfully, Belgium was able to both secure more employment of some of these graduates and also eventually facilitate the migration of some of these people after a few years after COVID calmed down a little bit. 
They're now expanding that program across the entirety of North Africa. So there will be two to 300 trainees across Morocco, Tunisia, and Egypt in ICT skills. The final thing I'll note in terms of contribution to the country of origin is that the skills that are trained for do not have to be exactly the same. So it may be that, say, Belgium needs, let's pretend, data engineers that require a two-year-long degree, whereas Morocco requires specialists that only maybe require a nine-month degree. This is not exactly the same skill, and it's not exactly the same thing that needs to be trained for. But the best part about this type of model is that Morocco will receive financial support for the training of those IT specialists that will stay in Morocco, even if the training programs that those people go on are completely different. It's about trying to build the global stock of skills within certain professions that are in demand everywhere to help people find opportunities both at home and abroad. And again, there are, there are many other lessons that we're learning. It would take far too much time to go into all of them now. And I do encourage people to get in touch if they would like to learn more. Thank you. That's really terrific. So I see we have some participants who are interested in engaging, which is terrific. Um, if I could just ask for the sake of time, if, um, if folks contributing could not exceed one or two minutes so that we have a little bit of time at the end for our panel to react. That'd be terrific. Um, I have a few that have already um, uh, asked for time even before the meeting started. So if I could turn first to Joel Adigi from the Inter International Trade Union Confederation in Africa. Joel, the floor is yours. Joel is unfortunately not connected. Okay, then that allows us to go directly to Leila O'Kane from MC Burning Glass. Layla, are Hi. you on? I am, can you hear me? Great, the floor is yours. Perfect, thank you so much for having me. Um, so what I wanted to talk about today is a little bit about how you can measure some of these skills gaps and understand some of the skills that are needed um, across different countries to better understand sort of the skill mobility uh, prospects. So um, I work at a company called MZ Burning Glass. We're a labor market analytics company. And I wanted to talk a little bit about how big labor market data can complement traditional sources of labor data to understand skills in a more granular way and to measure some of these labor shortages. So um, big labor market data, when I say that, what I mean is online job posting data, social profile data, other data that is sort of parsed and scraped from online sources that can give a real-time granular insight into the skills that are being demanded in the labor market and supplied in the labor market. And one of the things that this can provide for you is a very sort of localized look at what skills are, are particularly in demand. So you can see, for example, within an occupation, within a city, um, what are the skills that are being primarily demanded by employers? And that can kind of help inform some of that skills building policy work. Um, and in particular, you can also, so, so one of the things we've kind of seen to, to jump off of Helen's points about ICT skills is that uh, pretty much all jobs, especially in, um, in the U.S. and in other economies, require some baseline level of digital skills. And so including digital skill building, even if that is, is sort of just basic digital literacy, how to use a computer, um, is really transferable across a wide range of occupations. Um, for example, even in the construction sector, we're seeing that people are relying more on digital skills, more on using things like AutoCAD or other 3D tools. Um, in manufacturing, people are relying on digital skills to help understand where in the manufacturing process uh, different components are, um, using iPads to kind of track and log some of those processes. Um, and so this isn't sort of relegated only to office jobs, but it's happening across many, many sectors. And that's something that we see in, in our data. And I also wanted to speak just briefly about how you can use some of this big labor market data to track shortages in the labor market. So there are a couple different indicators that we have seen that can help indicate different levels of shortages. Um, one of them is if employers start to offer things like a signing bonus or a starting bonus or a uh, immediate, you know, pay upon start that can kind of indicate, hey, we don't have enough people in the pipeline for this. We really need folks to, to join this industry or this sector. And that's something we've been seeing in particular in the U.S. in healthcare, um, in agriculture and in construction. 
uh, which are sectors that I know that are relevant for um, many migrant populations. Um, other indicators that we have seen also include advertising the salary. So in the U.S., that's actually uh, sort of an uncommon occurrence to put salary information directly in a job posting. But if employers kind of start doing that increasingly, that can indicate that they're trying to be more transparent, trying to widen that applicant pool by saying, hey, this is exactly how much you're going to make if you if you take this job. We're also seeing a, a decrease in uh, requiring a bachelor's degree for some positions. So, you know, removing that bachelor's degree requirement and focusing really on specific skills that uh, talent might need to have that position can allow for a wider range of applicants to be eligible for that and can be an, another indicator that employers are feeling the effects of a labor shortage and wanting to be able to have more people um, able to apply to that position. So I just wanted to mention that these are some of the things we're seeing with our data and we would really recommend as a complement to some of the more traditional sources of labor market data to potentially look into some of the ways big labor market data, including online job postings and social profiles data can kind of help paint a deeper picture of this skill situation and help uh, policymakers understand where labor shortages might be happening. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Layla. That was really, really useful. I appreciate it. Um, Casey Myers, One Digital World. Do you want to jump in here, Casey? Hi, yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me. So I'm Casey Myers. I am the executive director and founder of One Digital World. We are a nonprofit based in California in the USA, um, although we work internationally. And so our goal is to connect, educate, and empower refugees and asylum seekers worldwide through digital skills and access to technology. Uh, originally, we had started by doing this in Europe, uh, where I'd worked with other organizations providing digital literacy and ESL classes through setting up computer labs inside refugee camps um, and have done this through multiple uh, islands it, throughout the Mediterranean. And then in the last few years have been working along the US-Mexico border in Tijuana with different migrant shelters there. And often um, I found we're really seeing a lot of the same issues. Uh, and so as they come through these border regions, we're seeing refugees and asylum seekers then being detained for months to years. Um, in migrant shelters, in refugee camps, uh, while they go through this processing. And then after um, looking very much forward to resettlement, upon resettlement often don't receive the services that they need in order to uh, fully integrate and be successful and self-sufficient in a new country and new culture. Our research shows us that even with services, it takes on average seven years um, for newcomers to integrate. And again, we're seeing many places where they're not receiving these services. So already uh, because of migration are being forced to overcome disruption in education, uh, disruption in employment and adjusting to new skills being required in a different labor market and a different culture. So the biggest barriers that we have seen in our work would be language barriers, um, reskilling to the new labor market and often, although there are resources for uh, providing these new skills, we see a lot that there's not the very basic introductory level. So maybe there may be more advanced uh, online resources. These have increased during COVID-19 and the pandemic as we see more remote access. But a lot of introductory level is missing. Um, Lack of transportation is a huge barrier to people moving into uh, new destination countries. And therefore, when they do not have access to computers and the internet, have no way to be able to attain what resources are available. Uh, women, we do see facing additional barriers are disproportionately affected by lower rates of education uh, and employment due to cultural needs and often childcare. So when available, um, we wanted to provide that service to increase access to women. Uh, we've seen huge, huge success in that. Now, our goals are to focus on SDGs number four and 10. So empower with skills and knowledge, language for joining the community, healthcare access, I heard that mentioned, and that's so important. Um, legal services so that people can have the state of mind that they are not focused on whether they'll be able to access their human rights and safety. 
employable skills for self-sufficiency. Uh, based on our research and experience, it's our recommendation for private and public sectors to invest in the following. Uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion services. So employing a diverse workforce, incentivizing both private and public to do that. Employment authorization needs to be faster and done correctly. Uh, we re recently received many resettled Afghan nationals. Uh, however, they faced huge, uh, huge barriers when gaining access to employment authorization and visas to be able to find employment, which then creates a uh, under the table workforce, leaving no opportunity to re receive uh, legal payment and therefore also not to be able to benefit and pay into the economy of the destination country. Uh, following up with what uh, Layla had mentioned before, we also noticed a need to increase a focus on hiring based on skills and not just degrees. Lastly, we want to provide integration training, language and basic skills training to get the best employees to invest in the future of the company and, and its employees. So the world has been facing the largest refugee crisis since World War II for the past six consecutive years. And as countries around the world continue to see increases in forced migration, whether that be large scale displacement or reception of migrants, all nations must work together to provide the necessary resources to protect both migrants and the welcoming communities. It's of great benefit to receive skilled workers and to increase uh, competition in the labor market and therefore invest in corporations and governments alike. Migration can be one of the greatest assets to both the community and the economy. Thank you, Casey. Um, I see that the Vice Minister of Venezuela is very patiently waiting. If I could give him the floor now, Vice Minister. Good morning. Good morning. And greetings. Everyone. Greetings to all to the participants and delegations invited from Venezuela. Uh, from we Venezuela would like to thank you for this celebrating this event to deal, deal with, with the permanent, permanent issue, issue of migration. On migration. Venezuela historically has always been a country, Venezuela a has country traditionally for migrants, but in the recent years. So Venezuela has traditionally been a country that hosted migrants. And despite the unilateral coercive measures that in consequence has given in the Venezuelan people a degradation of its socioeconomic conditions, accelerating and increasing migration of qualified citizens. It is a situation uh, directed to weakening the public policies and the capabilities of productivity for the people. For Venezuela, once this um, condition has been affirmed, it is important to promote the policies to promote and to encourage the comeback of our migrant workforce and qualified migrants who left the country temporarily due to economic reasons and they will come back to the country with important additional skills for uh, the best outcomes of the social conditions of the country. Therefore, we had adopted the objectives of the GCM for a safe, orderly and regular migration, the sustainable development objectives 2030, the country's plan 2025, and the missions and great missions plan. In this regard, due to the right to the migrants to come back and the protection of our citizens who are vulnerable, the Bolivarian government of the Mr. Nicolas Maduro Moro president has implemented the comeback to the country plan, which has drew the attention of a long, a great number of nationals, including there the qualified migrants. In 2021, we managed to have an economic growth in Venezuela, and in this year of 2022, we are thinking to really, we are advancing to increase this um, growth 
building progressively the right conditions to encourage the comeback to our country of our citizens who had been uh, outside, who had had to immigrate, uh, really attracting them with the creation of employment, the increase of the purchase power of the workers from Venezuela. In summary, to put an end to the adverse factors of a structural nature that had encouraged our citizens to leave the country in Venezuela. Through the Bolivarian Revolution, we are constructing and building up better social and political stability conditions for all the people and to encourage the comeback of our migrants and nationals and to allow them to have the right and dignified inclusion without any distinction to move forward in the highest happiness of the whole society. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your intervention. I now have uh, Tome Konga, the Deputy Director General for Migration and Foreign Service in Angola. Uh, Deputy Director General, the floor is yours. Muito obrigado, eh, senhores moderadores, ilustres palestrantes e caros participantes a esta sessão. Eh, a nossa participação nesta sessão é para prestarmos o nosso apoio aquilo que tem que se tratar de debater relacionado às qualificações de imigrantes. Eu penso que não devemos ter muita atenção, ter muita atenção para com os países receptores de imigrantes, receptores de imigrantes, ao terem a, a, em linha de conta que a qualificação linguística seja uma condição, seja uma condição necessária para a integração social. Porque vejamos que para os imigrantes que vêm de países de língua e expressão portuguesa como Angola, um sério comitê da língua inglesa quando tem que deslocar-se para Canadá, por exemplo, que é um país que oferece condições mais suficientes para os imigrantes, ele sai com uma língua portuguesa, é necessário que o país do setor integre esse imigrante dentro da sociedade canadiense, sem pensarmos que ele tem conhecimento de língua portuguesa, portanto, deve ser inserido dentro da sociedade. Isto acontece conosco, Angola, porque recebemos Angola é um país com, com bastante interesse na entrada e permanência em território de estrangeiros que prevalecem inteiramente ao alcance de todos os cidadãos estrangeiros que aqui entram. É, isso é, sem qualquer diversidade, sem qualquer restrição. Só que o estrangeiro entra, depois insere-se dentro da sociedade e a sua inserção na língua portuguesa pode se integrar em atividade socialmente útil em que ele está qualificado. Se porventura tivermos que pensar que é, ele traz a qualificação que ele traz do país dele, não vai ser possível. Nós atendemos aquilo que, de certo modo, tem a ver com na facilidade da imigração regular e o acesso aos direitos. Não poderão ter. Penso que é preciso que nós, os países e setores com maior valência ou maior vantagem para os imigrantes, pensem nisso e pensem-se em ressocializar os cidadãos que acolhem os seus países. Podíamos nós avançarmos com outros aspectos, eu penso que Dois aspectos restam, nós podemos apresentar isso 
nas conclusões, que é bastante importante, pensamos que vamos nos escrever a posterior. Muito obrigado. Thank you very much, Deputy Director, for your engagement. <clears throat> um, I now ask the ambassador from Sri Lanka, Mohan Pierce. Uh, thank you, panel, for giving me the floor. Uh, since migration of Sri Lankan labor to other countries became a trend in 1980s onwards, Sri Lanka has focused on skills development as a means to add value to migrant labor, as well as enhance the overall quality of migrant labor. Skills development is also a means to reduce irregular migration and the vulnerability of migrant labor. The Sri Lanka Bureau of Foreign Employment conducts a number of training programs for migrants prior to departure, including in language training, possible workplace hazards, and briefings on the culture and etiquette of the destination country. These measures, we believe, have over the years contributed to a qualitative improvement in the skills of our migrant labor. This also includes a framework to conduct training and skills development targeting emerging markets. A project proposal is also underway to enhance the existing recognition of prior learning programs. Uh, it is also known as RALP. The project proposal under consideration aims to provide a skills passport, if we were to call it, based on national competency standards and aims to develop a skills pool. Sri Lanka is also pleased to be actively involved as chair of the thematic area working group on skills and qualifications recognition process of the Colombo process. The sixth meeting of the thematic area working group virtually in May of 2021. Now, some of the key achievements of this working group include promoting the mutual recognition of skills and qualification frameworks within the Colombo process member states and between the Colombo process member states and countries of destination. Madam Chair, within the framework of the Abu Dhabi dialogue, Sri Lanka also contributed as part of the Troika to the thematic workshops on migration governance challenges, skills, mobility partnerships, and sharing of data employment opportunities for women in a changing employment landscape and regional and inter-regional cooperation and coordination. We urge that the international dialogue on migration takes into focus the achievements of such regional processes, which serves to realize the objectives of the Global Compact for safe, orderly, and regular migration. I thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Uh, may I ask Umahan Bardak from the European Training Foundation to join the conversation? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, well, um, I wanted to say different things in different <laughs> moments of the discussion. Now, coming to the end, uh, I'm probably the last speaker. I would like to say only maybe two or three points. Uh, the first thing is labor and skill shortages are, are a fact everywhere. We shouldn't forget that skills mismatch, labor shortages, skill shortages are the common problem, not only in the developing economies and our destination countries, but also in the countries of origin. It's becoming increasingly acute and there are already studies which uh, estimates that the next uh, decade will be uh, identified by uh, dramatic skill shortages, especially for medium skilled workers in middle income countries. So this is uh, my first point, which uh, brings me that for the need to, for more transparency and labor market information on skill needs not only in the destination countries, I think it should be more systematic both on destination but also origin countries, because this is the only way we can know the skill surpluses or skill shortages in a context, which should be the starting point for any skills mobility partnership. 
The second point is, is that, yes, we hear more and more skills mobility partnership, although its implementation is still quite limited. Uh, in fact, we as experts and international organizations are always more excited about skills mobility partnership than the national authorities, at least for the destination countries I'm talking about. Um, uh, there are also many other, uh, let's say, strategies followed. I can tell you already that from European perspective, automation is already one of them. And there is an increasing emphasis on automating different aspects of jobs, not only in manufacturing, but also services in agriculture. And we have to be, I think, uh, um, we have to keep in mind these trends as well, uh, as well as also the new trend of companies uh, starting their, uh, migrating their jobs from offline to online formats and increasingly tapping the global talent through websites. Uh, I think that we need to think uh, mobility in a broader perspective in that sense. Coming to my last, let's say, point is that at the end of the day, if we want to have more equitable um, uh, benefits of uh, countries of origin and destination, I think there is a need for a dramatic increase of investment on, in human capital development and increasing the skills pools, pool in general in all countries. This is particularly true for the sending countries, you know, traditional countries of origin. Um, in particular, maybe in specific shortage skills like digital skills, for example, everyone knows that it's, it's a shortage, not only in the, in the US or in Europe, but also in the many emerging economies. So what is needed is maybe reorienting re already existing human capital investments, also in terms of development assistance, towards more, uh, let's say, um, uh, meaningful areas, sectors, or skill uh, parts, so that this can be linked with the mobility. Um, and maybe one last point, again, this is really my last sentence, is I see increasingly that if we want to um, make skills mobility partnership more than just a project, I think we need more professional players here in terms of international labor and skills intermediation. I know that there are already companies, uh, head hunting agencies, etc. Uh, also international companies, companies, especially for the high skill, but we need a bit more um, innovative type of intermediation, which includes services of skills audit, validation and recognition, um, and as well as skills partnership, not only simple job placement, but more broader package of services at international level. Um, but doing this more professionally, not uh, done in a project life, but rather in a more professional way uh, with one bill of the cost, let's say, which can be easier for companies to engage with. I stop here, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I understand we have Kelso Carvalho from the Food and Agricultural Organization uh, who'd like to take the floor. Can I turn it over to you? Thank you very much, moderator. Migrants play a critical role in the agri-food systems. The pandemic has served to highlight how indispensable migrant workers are in that regard. Agriculture has many particularities, such as the seasonality of work and peaks in labor demand, and challenges such as weather conditions and physically demanding work. Meeting labor demands requires mechanisms to recruit and deploy enough workers with the right set of skills to respond timely to employers' needs, while at the same time protecting the rights of migrant workers. There may be few incentives for employers to invest in skills development of migrant workers due to the short term of stay 
and the nature of seasonal employment. Mood seasonal employment of agricultural migrant workers can offer migrants opportunities to acquire experience and improve their skills each season, while the employer has a secured labor force for the successive agricultural seasons. Skilling migrant workers can also be included in pre-departure and post-arrival training as part of a broader labor migration agreements to address labor shortages. It should also be considered that skills developed at destination can be applied in countries of origins when workers return home. Thank you. In agriculture, applicability is determined by the access to the same technologies as abroad, availability of identical crops in the country of origin, access to land, and plans to continue working in the agricultural sector upon return. Policymakers should assess the challenges and opportunities in relation to the most suitable and realistic skills development options for agricultural migrant workers, considering their short stay and the varying degree of skills applicability upon their return home. Thank you. There we go. Sorry, I couldn't unmute. Um, I have one. You're muted again, sorry. That work now? Yes. Good. Um, we have one last speaker and that is uh, IOM's good friend and former chairperson of our council, Ambassador Garcia from the Philippines. Ambassador, could I turn it over to you? Yes, thank you so much. Um, I'm just jumping in here quickly. You already heard from Undersecretary Ariola, so she's given you all the uh, policy and practical angles. I just would like to, number one, um, convey my deep appreciation continuing for the IOM and for you, Amy, DDG Amy Pope, for your continuing commitment. You've been at it forever, and uh, the Migration Week was an important thing. I think uh, one critical element here is the capacity of international organizations to work together on migration questions. This is very important. It does away with the stovepipes that used to uh, bedevil our setup. Now, just for three practical points. First, it is very important that we work uh, assiduously on expanding legal pathways. This is the most, the most effective form of protection we think you can have. However, just because you have a job does not mean you are immune from abuse. So therefore, it is necessary to ensure that there are no firewalls and that the workers, or whatever their status, have access to the necessary legal health and uh, labor services. This is very important to ensure all the objectives we have discussed. Uh, secondly, we would like to strongly endorse Nonetheless, government-to-government uh, -government cooperation. We have government-to-government -government cooperation with Germany for nurses and with Canada for certain skills. Uh, they are working very well, and we think that there are models that could be scaled up depending upon the needs. In the case of Canada, this is depending on the province. So our government negotiates with individual provinces. And the final aspect is we cannot ignore the role of the private sector. This has already been pointed out. But a very potent actor in the private sector are the recruitment agencies. And in our view, they need to be disciplined and they have to be given access to the information that was all discussed here. So frameworks have to be elaborated that would allow a greater degree of uh, compliance, if you want, and discipline of the recruitment agencies so that they understand what their responsibilities are. Oh, and uh, the last point, I forgot. Upscaling is critical in this fast-moving global economy of ours. Uh, the world is coming out of the pandemic, we hope. This is not going to in any way diminish the demand for skills and semi-skills all over the world. And it's important that we do this both in the destination country and in the home country. The dividends can be enormous in terms of preparation and foreseeing market trends. Uh, and we think that's something that we could all invest in. So I'm sorry for having been the last, to having been Anna, signing up so late, but I just came from another meeting at the ILO. So 
forgive me, Amy. Thank you. Uh, no, no <laughs> forgiveness is necessary. We always welcome your contribution. Um, so thank you. And very, very good points indeed. Um, I'd like to give our panelists the opportunity to respond to uh, the interventions that have been made and to provide any final statements that they'd like to make at this point. Um, if I could start with the Assistant Deputy Minister Jarvis from Canada, uh, the floor is yours. Oh, thank you so much. This has been a, a terrific uh, discussion on inclusion and empowerment and really looking at that labor economic migration um, nexus. I think, um, you know, really in reinforces the importance of safe, orderly managed migration across that continuum um, from development in the source countries through to uh, destination countries where settlement services, language, um, skill development um, continues to be important. Um, I think it's important to really leverage all pathways and optimize all of those pathways, both temporary and permanent, um, to, to support that managed mobility. And uh, in terms of skills development, just want to under, underscore the importance of that transferable nature of skills development. Um, so thank you. This has been a really, really interesting discussion. Thank you. Um, really useful interventions, which I hope um, our other member states and stakeholders will be able to take um, into their own practices moving forward. Um, Dr. Kaur, if I could just turn it over to you for any closing remarks um, or response to the interventions made. So thank you so much, um, uh, Amy, and you know, uh, I echo the sentiments that have been expressed by various people who have spoken before me, particularly uh, from the Philippines uh, and Sri Lanka, because I do identify with, uh, with all of us being the countries of origin. Uh, and all these issues of uh, disciplining the recruitment agents, of uh, upskilling, of investing in skills development, uh, etc. are extremely critical. And uh, at, uh, at National Skill Development Corporation uh, and at the Ministry of Skills, there's a ministry that was instituted in India in 2015, which really focused on this particular aspect of skill development, uh, as, as the word uh, suggests itself. Uh, so uh, as a country of uh, origin, I think, uh, as supply destination, we have a huge capacity that has been built over the past decade uh, for skilling. Uh, we have a huge uh, stock of skilled and certified uh, workers, both men and women. Uh, and of course, we have the demographic advantage uh, in India as well. So as a, as, a, as a supply destination, I think we are really well positioned, but uh, there are uh, challenges and there are issues that need to be overcome, uh, starting with access to information, uh, as basic as that, and then ensuring that we work closely together with the countries of destination. We invest in this together, not only for the sake of our uh, country, but also uh, where these uh, people will be working. Um, and then it is, um, uh, it, it's all cyclical in nature. It all comes back. Uh, uh, the global mobility is uh, truly global uh, uh, today. And therefore, if you invest here, you know, it's all coming back to your country one day or the other. So I think we are all in it together and are very happy to hear about the various um, uh, initiatives and activities uh, uh, that are being undertaken. So thank you so much. We definitely are all in it together. Um, thank you for that. Uh, final word, Ms. Dempster is yours. Go ahead. That's a lot of pressure, but thank you very much. Um, I do think it's important to keep what our end goal is in mind here, which personally I would say is building the skills of people, especially if they're operating in sectors that have a global shortage and helping them have access to a range of different labor markets and the ability to migrate in a safe, legal, and orderly way. So there are many different elements to consider in trying to reach that end goal. And I think we've heard about most of them in the session today, but I would like to emphasize one of the pieces that Ms. Bardak mentioned. It definitely requires additional and expanded coalitions, people, partners, countries to come together and explore where there is potential to better link migration and skills for mutual benefit. 
And so I really hope that this session has sparked an interest in doing so among some of these partners. And we at CGD are definitely here to help in any way we can. And I know IOM is too. So thank you very much for the invitation. I'm really looking forward to engaging with all of you in the future. Thank you. Thank you for being part of it. And thank you to our other panelists and our participants. Um, it's clear that this is um, uh, from many, many different angles, many different sides. Um, the, the idea of skills-based mobility is gaining traction. Um, and that's because it has real benefit. And I think we haven't fully tapped the opportunities uh, that it offers. And um, to do so in a way that is humane, uh, to make sure that migrants' rights are protected, to make sure that we're um, not contributing to brain, brain drain, but rather brain circulation uh, to lead to the development um, of, of countries and persons, uh, et cetera, and economies, um, all kind of come into this category. Uh, moving forward in terms of the Global Compact on Migration, Objectives 5 and 18 are really, you know, we're living it here. We're seeing it in, in practice and it will remain a priority uh, because we want to make sure that migrants of all categories, no matter who they are, no matter where they come from, are benefiting from the skills development and being recognized for what they are bringing to communities who host them and that we're really promoting safe, regular and orderly migration opportunities around the world. So with that, I thank all of you. I will end this panel. I'll turn it over to my colleague, the head of our governing bodies division, Dejan. Thank you everyone for attending. Thank you, Deputy Director General. Uh, thank you uh, all panelists and all participants for an excellent last panel of the first IDM session for this year. Now we are going towards the closing session. Uh, in the closing session, we'll have three uh, distinctive and distinguished uh, representative. The first one is uh, Amy Pope, Deputy Director General for Management Forum, who just moderated excellently the last uh, panel. Then we have uh, Johannes Luschner, Deputy Director General of the Directorate General for the Migration and Home Affairs from the European Commission. And we have Alicia Lelvik, Social Economic Integration Lead at the United Nations major group for the children and youth. I would like to invite all three for the closing session. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you so much to everyone. Um, I'd like to first invite Alicia Lelwick to um, offer her closing remarks uh, for this panel, for this session. Actually, the IDM as a whole, it's yours. Uh, thank you very much, Amy. Thank you, and thank you to IOM for the opportunity to represent you priorities here today. My name is Alicia Ledwig. I'm the Social and Economic Integration Lead at the Migration Youth and Children Platform, my CP for short. We are the migration constituency of the major group for children and youth. Uh, for the past three years, the MyCP has enabled youth participation in migration spaces at the regional and global fora, such as at the GCM regional reviews and the Global Forum for Migration and Development. Uh, recently, we have also co-hosted IMRF Preparatory Roundtable 3 on access to services together with WHO and UCLG. Uh, during the last three days of the IDM, we've heard a number of best practices and innovative approaches to protecting migrants in vulnerable situations, to advancing their socioeconomic inclusion, and to facilitating regular migration. The demographic boom across much of the developing world has made these areas particularly important for youth. Young people face higher rates of under and unemployment, lack opportunities, lack opportunities to make their voices heard, and often experience a feeling of exclusion from society. Given that youth also tend to have higher immigration rates that, than the rest of the population, making over 30% of international migrants, the issues discussed at this IDM are crucial going forward. 
Uh, however, at this point, we must move beyond recognizing the vulnerabilities of migrant youth to maximizing their roles in spurring development and broader prosperity. Children and youth have quite unique migratory experiences uh, that's probably due to their adaptability, their ability to quickly absorb a new language or culture. Their recommendations hold a sense of positivity about the future. Uh, youth tend to, face, um, the, tend to face the future with optimistic and fixed attitudes, which we hope further intergovernmental organizations and government can draw from. We should be listening to the recommendations of young people and include migrant youth in all stages of policy and program design, implementation and review, rather than make broad assumptions or their, on their behalf. Young people must be part of the solution to make migration safe for everyone. Member states and partners should ask themselves whether youth and other marginalized groups have been sufficiently engaged in developing solutions to opening legal migration avenues or migrant inclusion. Could the level of the engagement be a factor in the success or failure of a given solution? Young people must be meaningfully in involved in the development of bilateral and multilateral migration policies and instruments such as skills partnerships. As we found during our consultations, you have repeatedly called for access to decent jobs, the elimination of barriers to access the labor market, and more legal migration pathways. After three global youth forums bringing together hundreds of youth and uh, consultations gathering the perspectives of tens of thousands of young people, it is clear that young people care about migrant issues. As such, youth want and should be involved in the development of policies that are of key interest to them. Young people must also be meaningfully involved in international policy debates, uh, with meaningful being the key word here. Unlike the diplomatic community, young people do not have extensive experience in navigating spaces like the GCM. This is why they need to get prepared. The youth forums organized by MyCP are an example of a space for children that facilitate their engagement in policy processes. Uh, it's a platform that prepares young people before their participation, allows them to articulate their thoughts and learn uh, how to advocate effectively. Uh, to maximize the role of youth in migration policy processes, member states and organizations need to support and scale this type of tools and platforms provided by youth for youth. As part of uh, the MyCP, I'm privileged to work with youth making a difference from building incomes for vulnerable and displaced migrants through hospitality and tech training in Malaysia and Turkey and so much more. Let me just finish by saying that we, as MyCP, are ready to work with member states, international organizations, local authorities, private sector to help engage children and youth in the implementation of the global compact measures at local, regional and global levels. Thank you very much for the opportunity to share my remarks here today in presence, in, in presence of such inspiring and admirable colleagues. Uh, I am very honored to be here and I look forward to seeing effective actions and outcomes from the IMRF process. Thank you very, very much. Uh, Deputy Director General Johan Luchner. Thank you very much. I'll pick up where, where the previous speaker left off, the, the admirable. Uh, speakers and the learning that was also in in for us for these last three days. Uh, special thanks to you at IOM for dedicating this session of the International Dialogue on Migration to the implementation of the uh, Global Compact. Thanks also to the UN Migration Network for all the work going into the preparation of this forum. And of course, a big welcome from our side uh, to the report of the Secretary General on the implementation of the Global Compact. I would just like to uh, reiterate uh, the key objectives uh, that the European Union has and that show our commitment to the implementation of the 
uh, global compact. The global migration challenges require effective and comprehensive multi multilateral approaches, and they require strong international partnerships based on a shared understanding and a shared narrative, as well as joint policy priorities. The Global Compact provides these common principles and narratives that all countries can refer to, even on issues that are difficult to handle for all partners in this conversation, such as return and reintegration, or for countries as destination, as we just heard in the last panel, on labor migration. These policies are fully in line with the European Union's approach to migration, including the 2020 Pact on Migration and Asylum that has a very significant external dimension. They are also fully coherent with EU development cooperation policy and the consensus on development. What we believe is that migration and migration management require international cooperation in migration governance across the globe. Our aim is to build strong partnerships with countries of origin, transit, and destination. We need a balanced and comprehensive framework for engagement. Just by way of example, our partnership with African countries has been further strengthened during the recent European Union, African Union Summit, uh, where migration was also one of the subjects of discussion. The need for a comprehensive framework for migration was further underlined by the uh, COVID pandemic, which was mentioned uh, also and dealt with over, over the last days, and which has in particular affected migrants and unfortunately further deepened inequalities, vulnerabilities, and human suffering, as the discussions over the last days have demonstrated. At the same time, uh, they highlighted the reliance of many states, including many of the European Union's member states, on migrants in their workforce and the contribution, the valuable, invaluable contribution that they bring to our societies. The EU aims to mitigate the impact of COVID-19 on migration, including on migrants themselves. Our global response amounts to 46 billion euros. We are committed to playing the role in achieving global vaccination, which is key in order to restore mobility. During the recent European Union-Africa Union Summit, we reaffirmed our commitment to provide at least 450 million vaccine doses to Africa. And we are painfully aware that uh, the effort must not stop there. We actually must also make sure that people get vaccinated. We share the recommendation of the Secretary General's report that we need to build inclusive societies and include migrants in the COVID response and recovery plans. As I said, without migrants, we could not fight the pandemic and our economies could not recover without them. We have launched a new action plan on integration and inclusion for the years 2021 to 2027, proposing targeted and tailored support for integration and inclusion. The events of the last days and hundreds of thousands and very soon millions of people moving west towards the European Union have reminded us that saving lives is actually the number one priority of the European Union. The continued high number of deaths on migratory routes towards the European Union calls for continuous and further action in which cross-border operational cooperation and timely information sharing are crucial. We have stepped up our efforts inside the European Union to better coordinate search and rescue, disembarkation and relocation efforts, as well as efforts outside in cooperation with partner countries, for example, under the EU-UN Africa Union Task Force on Libya, the EU-IOM Joint Initiative for Migrant Protection and Reintegration, and more recently with the support package for the Afghan people and neighboring countries. Allow me to emphasize that 
the right to seek asylum and the principle of non refoulement are enshrined in EU law and we are taking allegations of pushbacks seriously. Any such allegations must be investigated and followed up upon by the competent national authorities. Expanding pathways for legal migration, including labor migration and better matching of skills as just discussed in the last panel are important elements of our comprehensive approach to migration. We will not be managed, I will not be able to manage irregular migration if we don't focus more on regular migration. Around 3 million migrants come every year to the EU legally. And we are constantly working to improve European Union rules in full respect of the national competences of our member states to make things easier for migrants wishing to come to the European Union legally. We will soon present a so-called skills and talents package that will include proposals for simplified procedures for applying to work and for, for residing inside the European Union while providing protection and ensuring fair treatment and to improve the rights of non-EU nationals already integrated in the European Union. In June 2021, we launched the so-called talent partnerships as a new tool to provide comprehensive policy and funding to better match skills and needs between the European Union, its member states, and the number of partner countries. We also recognize that universal access to legal identity is a cross-cutting issue for migration management and support international efforts to achieve this goal. We are very committed to strengthen efforts to tackle migrant smuggling and trafficking in human beings and have adopted new European strategies and action plans for that purpose. Those include enhanced rules on sanctioning smugglers and employers, non-criminalization of victims, and unconditional access to protection and justice for victims. We recognize the need to consider the complexity of climate change and address its adverse effects and look forward to assuming the EU chairmanship of the Geneva-based Platform on Disaster Displacement as of 1st July 2022, which will allow us to put the issue of disaster and climate-related displacement high on our agenda and strengthen our efforts. As you will know, uh, the number one priority of the European Commission is actually uh, to manage climate change. Concerning capacity building, which is another significant recommendation of the Secretary General's report, we also believe it is key and the EU support includes the EU-UN Partnership for Migration Capacity Building Project, through which we join forces with IOM as the chair of the UN Migration Network Secretariat. Looking at the future and in conclusion, in our development cooperation funding instrument for 20, the period 2021 to 2027, we have earmarked 10% of the funding to actions that are related to migration and forced displacement, including the fight against the root causes of migration. This will support our sustained cooperation with partners towards achieving the sustainable development goals, including through comprehensive migration partnerships. Continuing our work towards the International Migration Review Forum and the Progress Declaration, I would like to thank very warmly uh, the International Organization for Migration and DGV Torino for their leadership, for your leadership. We look forward to the discussions on the Progress Declaration and hope for a balanced outcome with best practices and recommendations encompassing a 360 degree approach. Let me, in conclusion, assure you that you can count on the EU institutions' support in implementing the objectives of the Global Compact on Migration, and we look forward to a successful IMRF that gives new impetus to the implementation of the GCM. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Deputy Director General. So we've now reached the end of three days of very rich discussion. 
and exchanges of good practices, experiences of successes and challenges in implementing the objectives of the Global Compact on Migration. I wanna thank all of you for your valuable time. We know this IDM session responded to the member states call in the resolution adopting the Global Compact on Migration to contribute to the International Migration Review Forum by providing relevant data, evidence, best practices, innovative approaches and recommendations. And that is what you have done over the last three days. So thank you. This is a very timely IDM. Many of you highlighted the relevance of the dialogue for your preparations for the IMRF. And we are very pleased to see the IDM's inclusivity and transparency. And we're very, very grateful to the multitude of stakeholders who have provided their views, their knowledge, and their experience. As Ambassador Fatima of Bangladesh, a co-facilitator, a co-facilitator of the IMRF mentioned, the discussions at this session of the IDM will input the zero draft of the progress declaration together with the secretary general's report, the regional reviews undertaken, the migration dialogues by the network on migration and the broad consultations with our member states and stakeholders. Please allow me to underline just a few of the key messages that have emerged from discussions in these last three days. And I promise I won't hit all of them, but these are the three that, the, a few of them that really just resonated. First, over and over, we heard of the need to strengthen and improve cooperation on saving lives and on the rights of migrants and on reducing the risks and the vulnerabilities of migrants. Significant progress has been made on achieving the GCM objectives in the past three years, despite the challenges of COVID-19. Nevertheless, as His Excellency Abdullah Shahid, President of the 76th General Assembly underlined, our successes remain fragile. We have to therefore build on these efforts through continued international cooperation and concerted action. And we heard the consensus on the need to improve cooperation, to expand legal pathways, to offer alternatives to the current dangerous migration routes, and thereby to undercut criminal networks who seek to exploit vulnerable people. There was also a call to protect data. The migratory context is highly, highly sensitive. The exclusive use of humanitarian of data for humanitarian search purposes must be assured so that all can have confidence in the data that's being collected and how it's being used. Second, there was very rich discussion on the need to address irregular migration, build inclusive societies, and expand social protections to cover migrants, including, and this is very important and timely, by providing them access to healthcare and vaccinations. It also emerged very, very clearly the right to be recognized as a person before the law, to enjoy one's human rights without discrimination and the right to legal identity is absolutely fundamental for safe migration. The good practices we learned about yesterday, they're really crucial to guide the road ahead for implementation of the Global Compact on Migration and to ensure that mobility during and after COVID-19 is accessible to all. There are a couple of key points here. First, we need to standardize identity documents across countries below the level of passports and identity cards. We need to digitalize access to legal identity while we are safeguarding the protection of data and the individuals. And speakers also highlighted the very important issue of a parallel shadow society and the environment this creates for exploitation crimes and a whole range of human rights abuses. How can these issues be addressed if not by creating opportunities for safe and regular access to labor markets and access to basic health services, including 
universal access to vaccines in times of pandemics. We heard of efforts to reach migrants and refugees in conflict and fragile states through the COVAX facility, which donated more than a billion doses to more than 144 countries. And finally, we discuss the critical importance of migration and climate change. We know the urgency upon us. We know that adaptation must be complemented by implementation and financing with a just transition approach. Let us take the opportunity of COP27 to advocate for and ensure that mobility is a key feature on the agenda of the COP. Ladies and gentlemen, so many actors over the last three days have generously shared their views, governments, United Nations agencies and bodies, organizations like the ICRC, civil society organizations. And if you'd allow me, I'd like to have a special word for the call made by our youth representative. Young people are our future. They must be given a voice. They must be meaningfully involved in the development of bilateral and multilateral migration policies and instruments. Let me thank you again for your participation in this very timely and important discussion ahead of the first International Migration Review Forum. It is truly impressive how much knowledge and experience was shared in this forum and how many similarities we find among various actors if we allow ourselves an open and frank discussion. We appreciate your time and we know that some of you joined us in the middle of the night. We will ensure that the good practices and recommendations shared at the dialogue over the last three days are included in our report that we will have ready in time for the IMRF. We hope this will serve you as a resource and will allow you to input the review forum as requested in the resolution adopting the GCM. Thank you for your participation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Dejan, I think that's your cue. I can just say thank you all and see you in October on our next IDM that we'll held here in Geneva, hopefully in person. Thank you all.